the overwhelming express opposition from the victim's family. And as Mr. Brown has said, each and every one of us have a different function. And I, I have a different function on this board. I am the victim's advocate. I am the person who keeps the victim in the process. And a victim plays a very, very important part in this process. And a victim's family plays an even more important part of this process. And I have an obligation when I see this much express opposition from the DA's office, from law enforcement, and from the victim's family, the nature of the crime that was committed only 27 years ago, my vote is to deny your request this morning. Thank you. Two out of three, is it? Two votes out of three, what's uh, Mr. Uh, Dozier, uh, you've received the two of three votes to uh, grant your parole uh, under our rules and guidelines. Uh, your parole has been granted to that. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Glory to uh, God. <laughs> I am Mel Wilson's father, and we were all nine. It appears to me what you're going to do, you're going to do when you got here. No, why why yes. put my family through all this? If we already well, that 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 is is not accurate, sir. We do review these files before we prepare them in advance, but we often come in here. Uh, believing one thing when we read reports and change our mind when we hear people. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. certainly are prepared. Thank we you certainly for your time. didn't come in here with uh, preconceived notions. We appreciate your time. Very much. They're down there, so they make the action bearing the family plot on top of daddy. So go to go to the area, even on the way down there. They got the hole dug, they got the casket right there. And uh, you know, all the final words are being said, but everybody's still kind of milling around and everything. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, you know, okay. it, was, it was just. And, and so the, the, the wife, she's still around or whatever. And I see her son in law, and I see kind of what's going on. And they're trying to lift this casket down in the hole. And it's like, like this. And I see them go get a two by four. And they over there and just cranking on the, the handles on the side.
Video Parole is called back to order. The time is 11.20. Uh, our next case is Mr. James E. Smith. Mr. Smith, uh, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? James Edward Smith, 84129. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow the participants who've indicated they have in, uh, they wish to speak to have their input. Uh, here on your behalf today is uh, Joyce Wilderson, Damaka Smith, Shawanda Nelson, and Elsie Smith. Uh, also present is Ann Cohen, Aisha Cohen, Natasha Cohen, Reginald Smith, and Willie Smith. Uh, here in opposition uh, is Mr. Roy Breland, uh, Ms. Linda Wall, and Ms. Mary Graham. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our procedure, sir? Yes, sir. This is uh, the matter of James E. Smith, DOC number 84129. Date of birth, August the 31st of 1946. He's a second class, of, he's a second uh, offender, classified as a second offender. He has a parole eligibility, he has an adjusted good time date of August the 7th of 2038, a full term date of September the 26th of 2091. He is serving uh, a 115 year sentence on the charge of attempted aggravated rape where he was uh, adjudicated a habitual offender and aggravated crime against nature. Uh, Mr. Smith, is that all accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, uh, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. Mr. Roche will end his questioning of you. Would you please answer any questions he may have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Smith, how are you? Good morning, sir. Mr. Smith, currently 76 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you've been convicted of two felonies, and this is a re hearing. When was your last hearing? Last hearing? Was, yes. uh, last hearing I had was in 2017, sir. I came back on court. Uh, how about 2019? Yes, sir. 2019. Yes, sir. And, and you were denied because of victim opposition and law enforcement opposition, and the judge was opposed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I see why you've earned 404 days good time. Tell me about some of the program that you've completed. I think you've been incarcerated for 46 and a half years. Yes, Is sir. that correct? Yes, sir. So tell me about the programs you completed. I completed uh, victim opposition. I haven't completed it yet, but I've been to cage your raise, pre uh, 100 hours, taking over you. And uh, now I'm in process of victim opposition. I haven't completed that yet, sir. Uh, victim uh, awareness? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, have you completed all four phases of your sex offender treatment? Yes, sir, I have. Tell me exactly what you got out of sex offender treatment. I got a whole lot out of that, sir. So tell me what? I know how the how far to steer away from a certain school a perimeter, sir. I know how far to right. steer away from there. Sir, how about the victim and how you affect the victim emotionally, mentally, and physically? Physically? I rephrase your question, sir. How uh, what did you learn about the victim of this crime and how she was affected emotionally, mentally, and physically? 
emotionally and physically? How did this crime affect the victim? Oh, it's I affect the victim. It's, I know it's, it's sadly, it's, 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 it affected them badly, sir. I know it's a bad on my part. It affected them badly. I victimized everybody, sir. Did you threaten to kill the victim? No, sir. I victimized everybody, sir. I think if it wasn't for the car that pulled up in front of the house, and you said that your son, her son checked on her every morning, you grabbed your clothes and you ran out, you would have harmed that lady more than raped her. No, sir. Okay. Well, let's get started with the interview. Uh, you really, September of this year, you've been incarcerated 47 years. You've been parole eligible since February 1996. 27 years. How many parole hearings have you had in 27 years? How many parole hearings have I had? Four? Yes. Four. And you've been denied four times. Yes, sir. You were approximately 30 years old when you committed this crime, is that correct? 20, 30 or 27 years, yeah, really. Well, you've been incarcerated for 47 years and you're 76 years old. So I, I think you were about 30 years old when you committed this crime. So tell me, what was going on when you were 30 years old that spirit, spirit uh, was the emphasis for you committing this crime? Stupidness. Stupidness. You weren't, you weren't young, you were 30 years old. I would say ignorance. Hatreds. Okay. Did drugs or alcohol play any part in this crime? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And what kind of drugs and alcohol did you use the night that you committed this crime? Alcohol, wine. Any legal drugs? I used to say illegal drug, yes. And what and what and what kind of drugs did you use? Marijuana. Anything strong marijuana? Anything stronger than marijuana? I used to take frying pan stuff and slip it through my nose. Were you intoxicated the night that you committed this crime? Semi. What kind of treatment have you received to uh, address the problem you have with drugs and alcohol? Since I've been locked up? Yes. Well, since I've been locked up, I try to deal with my own problems. What kind of programming have you taken Living in balance, celebrate recovery, substance abuse, NAAA meetings. Have you participated in any of those programs? Well, they told me to stay away from substance abuse because I didn't take it. I didn't see I had no drug problem when I came here. But you did have a problem. Yeah, but I didn't say that. So when, so when you entered prison, you told me that you didn't have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Nope. Consequently, you received no rehabilitative uh, program to work on that situation. Is that correct? No, sir. 
What name, bro? Yes, sir. Would you look in his jacket to see if there's any substance abuse education or treatment? No, sir. I'm looking at his lawn. Uh, he told them when he first came in here that he didn't have a substance abuse problem, so therefore they didn't give him any substance abuse treatment. Thank you, Warren. You're welcome. Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. How long did you engage in smoking of marijuana? How many years? Yes. Quite a few years, sir. So we, so you, so you started probably when you were a teenager, right? Yes, sir. So, and you commit this crime at third, so we talking 10, 15, 20 years. Yes, sir. Okay. How long did you sniff chemicals? A few years. Maybe 20, 10, 15 years, sir. So, so basically, you do have a substance abuse problem that's unaddressed at this time. Okay. Yes, what is your current job assignment? Do you still have a job assignment? Right now, I'm, I, I have a problem with my lower back. Just I'm assigned to a kitchen, but I don't hardly do anything, sir. So, so you're on semi. Uh, just. Disabled to work mm -hmm. because I have a lower back disc problem. He has a known status. Are you are you a trustee? Yes, sir. Boyd Amber. Um, yeah, he's minimum B. He's supposed to work in the kitchen, but he don't. Okay. Um. Now, Mr. Smith, you've been incarcerated for almost 47 years. How are you going to support yourself if and when you're ever released? Sir, I'm able to do certain things, like do certain hobby craft. I'm able to do certain work. Like do uh, Mr. Smith, are you? for Social Security or any form like SSI? Yes, sir. You are eligible for Social Security? Yes, sir. Tell us what I see you have a transition plan with your sister in Tangible Hall in Louisiana. Tell us about that transition plan. Where are you going to live if and when you get released? I'm planning on going to live with my sister in Texas after I've transferred to Texas. Okay. Now, the plan I have in my paperwork is a sister that lives in Tangible Hall, Louisiana. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But I want or to are you still with your sister in Texas? But I want to live with her for a while, and then I want to transfer that to Houston, Texas, too. If that's okay with y'all. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith has a low risk assessment. He has a fair institutional record. And his last disciplinary write-up was in November of 1999. From 23 years ago. Do you remember that write up, Mr. Smith? Yes, sir. What was that write up for? Disobedience. Disobedience, number five. Yes, sir. So, what happened in November of 1995 that you discovered that you needed to follow rules and regulations in the last almost 24 years? You've had no write-ups. Disobedience, 1995. But tell me why you haven't had any write-ups since then. Keeping a clean record. 
I do keep a writing record. I doing what the people tell me to do. So let me go over your programs. You probably missed a couple programs you completed. Thank you for a change. You completed all four phases of your sex offender treatment, anger management, 100 hours pre release, health care training, Malachi dance, and multiple faith based programs. You have opposition to your early release from the DA's office, the sheriff's office. You have five letters. Uh, five letters were sent out to the victims' families, and we got we received no response. But we do have uh, the victim family here this morning, and they will make their statements a little later in the presentation. Mrs. Smith. I see that you recently made some hospital visits. How is your medical issues? It's in bad shape, sir. I see the last time you went to the hospital was in February of last year. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Are all your medical issues under control? No, sir. I got it. A period of heartbreak, sir. Okay. Are you receiving medication and treatment for that? I had to go check on that this morning, but I delayed it for a reason because I had a parade. I had to meet the board today, sir. Okay. How are you feeling today? Kind of shaking right now because I'm nervous because I had to meet the board. I had to go. Okay. Warren Ambo, do you have any comments, concerns, or remarks at this time? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Thank you, Warren Ambo. Mr. Tim? Yes. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you been taking literacy classes? Yes, ma'am. Do you know how to read yet? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I mean, how long? How long have you been taking literacy classes? Quite some time, ma'am. Because sometimes I go up and down. Because the scores go up and down, ma'am. Okay. Um, are you currently enrolled in literacy classes? Yes, ma'am. All right. I thank you. That's all. Thank you, uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, now we hear from your supporters. Uh, we actually have four people that wish to speak, but we only allow three to speak. So uh, y'all need to decide uh, whether it's uh, Ms. Joyce Wilderson. Jamaka Smith, Shawanda Nelson, or Elsie Smith. One of the four of you is not going to be able to speak. So. All right. Well, I guess I'll choose. So we'll ask uh, Ms. Joyce Wilderson, if you please come. My name is Joyce Elwood. I am the sister of James Elwood Smith, 84129. He is the oldest of our family. <laughs> James has been in anger for over 40 plus years. He is up in age, he's sickly, and can y'all please
Steve and Yahoo to grant him parole. So he would be able to come home. So I would be able to take care of him. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wilkinson. Uh, Ms. Damaka Smith. Good morning to the board. My name is Damaka Smith. I'm Damaka Smith. I'm the niece of James Smith. It's my privilege to stand here before you guys, so, you know, to ask the grants for him to be released. The good person, yes, he can make mistakes, but we learn from our mistakes. We don't stay there, we move. So it's my person to come up and say, you know, you know, all the parts of the minds to have my uncle released. He's been incarcerated for almost 50 years. And I'm just praying, you know, that he can be released. Thank you. Ms. Shawanda Nelson. Good morning to the Lord and to family. We are not negating what has happened to this family. Our uncle has served 47 years. He has done his due diligence. He was a young man when he came in. All of us make mistakes and all of us grow from our mistakes. I believe that my uncle James Smith have learned from his mistakes. He have, since he's been incarcerated, tried to the best of his ability to do better, not only for himself, but for others as well. Again, we all make mistakes and we cannot negate to this family what has happened. And we're not trying to do that. What we are saying today is that our uncle has served over 47 years incarcerated, not being in our lives. And we understand that something happened to another family as well. And I reiterate that. We are not saying that nothing happened. What we are saying is that our uncle have grown from the time that he has been incarcerated until now. He is not that 30 year old man. He has grown, he is 76 years old, and we are asking, we know that his time on this earth is short, that you would allow him to be with his family in the rest of his last days here on earth. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we're here from the opposition, uh, Mr. Uh, Roy Breland. Good morning. Uh, who wishes to? Uh, are you, Mr. Breland? Yes, I'm. Okay. Oh, yes. uh, Ms. Graham, you wish to speak? Okay, yes. this is uh, Ms. May Graham. Thank you, Ms. Graham. You'll introduce yourself, please. Yes. Tell us what you'd like us to know. My name is May Graham. I am the victim's daughter. She came to live with me after this happened. So I've seen personally the suffering and the misery she went through in the rest of her life until she died. She was terrified of the dark. She was terrified of everything. It was a miserable rest of her. I cannot describe to you how this affected her. She had seven kids. My dad died. I was five. 
She was less than a year old. He was about 14. No, nine. Nine. Yeah. She ran the bus. There was nothing. She suffered a lot. But this was the most horrible thing that could have never happened to me. And he is not truthful. He is not accountable. He threatened her life. Repeated. Where we were, she was living at the time. It's about six miles from where we lived. He walked all the way over there. He had time to think. This was planned. She was isolated. There was nobody close by. He knew that. She had been there for 20 years. It's a small community. Everybody, although I, we didn't know him, everybody knew everybody. And we lived there our whole lives. He walked that far planning this. There was nowhere else for him to go there. There was no business. There was no other homes. She was strictly isolated. He knew that. He took advantage of it. He planned it. I feel like if someone had not drove, he would have killed her. If he was just wanting to go there and insult her, he would have done that and lay up under cover of darkness. This was after daylight. What was he going to do? Stay, stay the rest of the day. There's no other thing that I could possibly think of that he was going to kill her. And she thought he was going to kill her. He repeatedly, repeatedly told us he was going to kill her. She kept asking, are you going to kill me? And he said, yes, I'm angry. You beg, you know, please do not let this person go. He's 70 something years old. I'm 70 years old. I'm still working. There's a lot more life after 70. And he has been an habitual offender. This wasn't the first time. It what my understanding. He's done this before several times that it before he goes to her house that is so isolated he knew what he was doing he doesn't even say he was drunk or make an excuse he intentionally did this and her life was totally she had a hard life she couldn't even enjoy her own age. She had to have somebody with her. Out. She was terrible. It never went away. She served her sentence. Let him serve his sentence. Let him serve just like she had to serve. Thank you for having us here. Thank you, Dr. I want to thank y'all for your time and patience and hearing me out. I'll be short about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And to the point, this man intentionally come there to kill this woman and unspeakable act. Can you imagine the terror she went through hour in, hour out, out. him um, you know, committing these unspeakable acts. She asked him, are you going to kill me? She, he says, I, you don't see my face now. So, yes. I had a nephew, her son, stayed with him quite a bit, quite, quite a bit with her. He was five years old. He would have killed him right off the bat if he would have been there. And the reason he would kill him, he couldn't hate him. He's a high-strung kid, and he would have been bouncing around all over the place in order to to commit his act and stay there hours, after hours, I cannot believe that somebody would do that to an old woman. 
And this man is a bitch offender. This ain't a first time thing. I knew one of the old ladies that he tried to. He broke into her house. I mean, he wasn't invited in. He didn't just walk in. He broke into her house and tried to assault her. Luckily, she was surrounded with a lot of people. And she was uh, she managed to run out of there screaming. The poor old lady couldn't hardly walk. Why would you want a 30-year-old man want to assault a woman that is 60 to I think she was probably 70 to 80? Because I knew her not very well, but I fact of the matter, I used to carry pay rent to her or of the place that we were renting. And I knew the lady. And uh, the when the judge when when the judge and the jury heard this story, they heard the true story, everybody, and they decided at that time this man was guilty. He is an habitual offender. So I don't think he's got, I really don't think he's got the capability of not offending again. If he's able to walk, he will offend again. And he would be here for murder if he hadn't been scared off by somebody coming looking for a cow that morning. Just drove up. They didn't. And the mama said the last thing she's seen of him, and that she carried that to her grave. But him running down the road trying to put his pants on like a coward. He wouldn't stand and 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 go against anybody but a 60, 70, 80 year old woman that uh, he could control. And I just don't, I can't understand how anybody like him could ask to be let out. Much less, you know, that's condoning what the jury said to start with. This man is in there for 115 years. And I just don't believe. I would, would you, anybody in here want him exposed to their grandchild, their grandmother? Now that he's in bad health and older, who would be next? Would it be little kids that he can control? And that's all I really have to say. And I appreciate y'all signing here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're can I just say one well, just thank you. Thank you. Um, two of the children, my brother and my little brother, still live in Cashville Parish. They live not right in that town, but they're close in the vicinity on that area still. Thank you. No, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> Mr. Smith, is there anything you'd like to say before the panel votes? I ask y'all for mercy, sir. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Sam Wigman. Mr. Roche. Mrs. Smith. You're a different your case is a difficult case. You're going to be 77 in September of this year. You have serious medical issues. You've been incarcerated for almost 47 years. And you have a problem. And you hadn't addressed that problem with substance abuse. Before I deliver my decision, I want to thank the victim's family for their appearance today. I appreciate your statements, but there's three reasons for incarceration. First reason is isolation. Because that person is a risk to public safety. At the age of 77 years old, with a medical issue that Ms. Smith has, I don't think he's a danger to society. Second reason is retribution. Punishment for the crimes that have been committed. 
Mr. Smith has been incarcerated for almost five decades, 47 years. And then rehabilitation. Mr. P Mr. Smith has taken Thank You for a Change, Anchor Management, a host of other programs, Medicaid Dads, $100 free release. The only thing that he doesn't have is substance abuse education. And I may be wrong, but under the care of his sister, with a very tight curfew and a restriction of no contact with the victim family, I think we can solve that by him attending NAAA meetings at least two or three times a week. Having said all of that, I'm going to grant Mr. Smith's request based upon <laughs> security take out take out. Thank you. Oh, the building. Mr. Smith, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to grant your request based upon your age, based upon the length of your incarceration. That is the only two reasons that I can think of for granting, because I don't think you are dead to the society, and you serve almost 47 years of incarceration. Your conditions after release, you must follow all requirements of your sex offender registration. You must register as a sex offender and you are to follow all recommendations or requirements of that sex offender contract. Yes, sir. And I want you to have a curfew from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m. Between those hours, you are not to be outside of your sister's home. Oh, yes, if, if you come in contact with the victim's family, you are to vacate that space immediately. I don't want you having any contact. Yes, sir. Family. Yes, sir. You know, this is I hear you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Berkshire. Ms. Jackson. All right, Mr. Smith. Um, I concur with my colleague based on your age, the fact that you've served almost 50 years in prison. I had any write ups since 1999, and that you have um, participated in good programming, both like what Peter Grant with the same condition. Thank you. I'd like to thank the victims' family for being just encouraged. Uh, I concur with my colleagues. Based upon his age and the time that he's in prison, like the conditions is outlined. 
The parole has been completed, uh, Mr. Smith. Good Thank luck. Thank you, sir. Thank y'all. Thank y'all.
Committee on Parole is called back to order. Uh, our next file is our next case is going to be Mr. Charles O. Burns. Mr. Burns, if you would please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number. Uh, Ms. Mr. Marabella, we actually have Bernell Coleman. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. We can take him. <laughs> Hey, Warden, how are you? Good morning, Mr. Coleman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Mr. Lancaster, how are you? Uh, our next case is Mr. Burnell Coleman. Mr. Coleman, would you give us your full name and DOC number? Burnell Dale Coleman, 99553-3. Do you have a sheet on Mr. Coleman? <laughs> this is the matter of Burnell Coleman, DOC number 99553. Mr. Coleman's date of birth is April the 15th of 1958. Coleman is a third class uh, felony offender. He has an adjusted good time date of December the 17th of 2025, a full term date April the 16th of 2026, and he's serving a 40-year sentence on the charge of purse snatching, having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, is that information correct, uh, Mr. Uh, Coleman? Yes, sir. Mr. Coleman, uh, I want to explain our procedure to you. You have several people who are speaking here uh, in support. Mr. Gary Myers is here with the Louisiana Parole Project. Mm -hmm. Bob Lancaster is here uh, as your attorney. Simon McCray is here as a law student uh, uh, attorney as well with Mr. Uh, uh, Lancaster. You also have uh, two other persons who are here in person, Jackson Andrus and Ben McCarthy. Uh, your case has been assigned to me, so I will begin our discussion. Mr. Coleman, how old are you, sir? 64. Mr. Coleman, how long have you been in prison on these charges? 38 years, sir. Mr. Coleman, uh, tell me a little bit about what was going on 38 years ago. How old were you when you... Came to prison this time? Uh, I think I was in my uh, late 30s. All right. Tell me what was happening with uh, Burnell Coleman. What were you doing? Did you have a job? No, sir. Uh, uh -huh. I was in the streets um, trying to survive or uh, trying to support family and friends. Uh, every job I try to get. Uh, once they found that I was a convicted felony, they let me off the job. Were drugs and alcohol an issue with you? Yes, sir. Tell me about that. Now, how, long, how old were you when you first started doing drugs? 15. What did you start using? Marijuana. Progress from there? Yes, sir. Fields. Cocaine? No, sir. Just marijuana pills, and I did a little heroin. Okay. And how often were you doing it? Um, just about every other day or every day. And for how long? Well, for quite some years. You pled guilty in 1980 to an attempted armed robbery. Were you doing drugs back then? Yes, sir. Have you ever had any sort of uh, drug uh, treatment on the outside? No, sir. How about alcohol? Did you drink alcohol as well? No, not really, sir. And mainly drugs? Yes, sir. How much education did you have? Uh, did you finish high school? Yes, sir. I was 
I was pushed through high school because at that time was my gifted for playing sports. Okay. So you were an athlete, you were in high school? Yes, sir. And did you graduate high school? Yes, sir. So tell me about this purse snatching. Tell me what happened. Well, me and some friends were riding around and we seen this lady walking the street with a briefcase and a big purse and jumped out the car and grabbed the purse. Okay, now, I've read the police reports and looked at the file. And this lady was beaten as well. So tell me exactly what you did. Well, I grabbed her purse, she fell on the ground, and I snatched the purse from her, and she was dragged a minute because she wouldn't turn it was the purse. So she would she resisted you, and and uh the report suggests that you kicked her, punched her. Is that all true? Yes, sir. Were you on drugs at that time? Yes, sir. Been using drugs that day? Yes, sir. Let's talk about when you came to prison 38 years ago. How have you changed since then? Tell me what, if anything, uh, uh, that you've done while you've been in prison has been has impressed you and, and allowed you to change. I see your shirt. I have changed. Tell me how you've changed. Well, uh, I take responsibilities for all my actions. Uh, God has been uh, in my life. Um, I have got with positive people to where I can think positive, uh, do more constructive things, and take responsibility for my own action. Now, you, you've taken substance abuse, I believe. Uh, what other programs have you taken with reference to your drug addiction? Um, I took thank you for a chance of an abuse, uh, 100 hours per release, uh, raging Cajun. Yes. Cajun rage. Cajun rage. Cajun rage. <laughs> I understood. Right. I went to USL, so I know what a raging Cajun is. <laughs> and, you know, um, I must say, through my uh, experience with my medical condition, and you know, God gave me another chance because I died twice. We're going to talk about your medical condition in just a few moments. Uh, you've had 209 write ups while you've been in prison. Have any of those involved intoxication? Uh, one time, sir. And when was that? Uh, so when I was in DCI. I think How long ago? Was, I think that was like I think around 2001, 2002. What, what, your, what is your sobriety plan? What, uh, can we both agree that you're a drug addict? Yes, sir. So what, what is your plan to make sure, and I understand you've got medical issues and I understand that, but what is your plan to make sure that you don't go back to using drugs the way you were using them before? Well, not just because of my medical condition. God have blessed me to have grandkids and great grandkids and I want to live for them, sir. Are you familiar with the 12 step program? You took yes, some sir. substance programs. I took 12 step uh, um, we threw ourselves back in, um, I think around 98, somewhere around up in there, 98, 99. Have you ever gone to AA meetings? Of course. Yes, okay, sir. Well, I, I, I need to know that. You said back in 98, you, you, uh, you took the 12 step. That was 24 years ago, 26 years ago. So have you done anything with uh, AA meetings or anything like that since then? No, sir, because I've been in and out of the hospital. Okay. Uh, do you believe that AA meetings are important and helpful for of course, your sobriety? Of course. 
Of course. If you were to be released, would you go to AA? Do you think AA is important in your life? Yes, sir. I believe I can be a great help to other individuals besides myself. Now, what other courses have you taken that you think have been helpful to you? Um, Raising Cajun, um, um, anything else that just stands out? Something that you uh, you said you took thinking for a change. Yes, sir. What did you get out of that program? What do you remember out of being, that program? Being, being responsible uh, for your own actions, having respect for others, what is yourself. Let's talk a little bit about your medical condition. Tell me about your medical condition. Well, I had 10 heart attacks. I have stents. I have COPD. High blood pressure and uh, my lungs are damaged. I have to have oxygen almost 24 7. Now, while you've been in prison, you got an obscenity charge. What was that about? Uh, they said I was flirting with the female, which I were. And that was a conviction. That was a, they charged you with that, right? right. Yes, sir. How long was that? That's, uh, I think that was 2004, 2003, somewhere back there. And uh, you have three children. Do you have any contact with them? Uh, I have contact with one daughter and my granddaughter and my great grandkids. <laughs> Where will you be staying? I, I see Mr. Myers is here. You're going to the parole project. Where will you stay? Uh, what's your transition plan? What do you hope to do uh, if you are paroled? Um, be productive for where, society and community. Where, where are you going to live? Where, where would you be? Living in New Orleans with a okay. car. What, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Coleman? Um, everything that he has called you and that you have spoken of seems to be uh, of the truth of nature. So I really don't have anything to add to it. You have a low risk uh, assessment, Mr. Coleman. Uh, you do have some law enforcement opposition and some uh, victim opposition. Uh, I think that's all. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's hear from uh, your supporters. Mr. Myers? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Terry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Um, Parole Project is, is uh, going to support Mr. Coleman's transition. However, based on his medical condition, the, the severity of his medical condition and his support system, um, we will do that. He will go uh, to his residence in New Orleans, uh, where he does have uh, uh, family support. Our case manager, who works out of New Orleans, uh, will provide him support. We'll make sure he gets connected uh, to all the services that he needs. He, he is SSI eligible. Uh, we'll make sure we, we get all his Medicaid so he can get his oxygen smooth transition into, into making sure he gets his oxygen requirements uh, because he's going to need that on a on a long term daily basis. Uh, we will transport him uh, back and forth to Baton Rouge for for the programming that's that's uh, relevant to him, uh, and again continue to uh, provide case management in the New Orleans area. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Myers. Uh, Mr. Coleman, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to Mr. Uh, Lancaster and Mr. Craig? Well, yes, sir, I would like to thank, first of all, foremost, I would like to thank God and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be presented in front of the board. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lancaster? 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, Robert Lancaster here today representing uh, Bernal Coleman uh, with the LSU Parole and Reentry Clinic. Uh, with me today is Diamond McRae. She's a second year law student at the LSU Law Center. She's not certified under Louisiana Supreme Court Rule 20. Uh, she did help Mr. Coleman prepare for today's hearing. Uh, also worked and prepared the brief and packet that was submitted to the committee in advance. If the committee deems it appropriate, Ms. Diamond is prepared to make a final statement of support. Okay, Ms. McRae. Thank you. Members of the committee, there is nothing that can undo this senseless act that Mr. Coleman committed or undo the pain that his actions caused the victim and her family. He lives with regret and remorse every day of his life. Mr. Coleman's childhood and early adulthood were plagued by crime and property, and excuse me, poverty. As Mr. Coleman grew older, he grew more bitter as he tried to find his way, and he admits that he took the cowardly way to handle his problems. The past 38 years have been a humbling experience for Mr. Coleman. He began his sentence as a healthy, strong-willed man who felt like the world owed him something. Today, he sits before you as a respectful, frail man with extensive health issues that have him confined to a wheelchair and requires him to use supplemented oxygen 24-7. Mr. Coleman has participated in some programming over the years, but was never able to take full advantage of it because he has battled his health for 26 years. Since being incarcerated, he has had his gallbladder removed, two hip replacements, and has been hosp hospitalized for over 10 heart attacks. He is currently prescribed six different medications that he is required to take daily. Mr. Coleman is also on a strict low sodium diet and sometimes requires breathing treatments throughout the course of the day. Mr. Coleman has grown far away from the young, bitter man who committed these crimes. He often says he didn't change by himself, but God changed him. The man before you today is not a reflection of the person he was in 1986. Given his health issues and his older age, Mr. Coleman has not only naturally matured out of crime, but he is now a man rooted in humility. He has a holistic reentry plan with the full support of the Parole Project and his family who is committed to ensuring that he maintains his sobriety. For these reasons, I respectfully ask you all to vote in favor of granting Mr. Coleman early release through parole with any conditions you all see appro appropriate. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Craig, for board very quickly. Yes. Uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, I enjoyed talking with you. Uh, I, I uh, accept the message uh, you have on your shirt. I believe that you have changed. Uh, you've been in prison for uh, 36 years. Uh, you've taken some programs, uh, uh, but you've come a long way while you've been in there. Uh, based upon uh, your low risk, based upon some of your medical issues, based upon the things that you've done while you've been in prison, uh, and you have a good transition plan through the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, my vote would be to grant your parole uh, to the Louisiana Parole Project to be supervised and work with the Louisiana Parole Project, follow whatever rules they set up for you. And I would want you to get a substance abuse evaluation, follow whatever treatment is required and necessary. Uh, and I would, would uh, order at least uh, two AA meetings per week for the first six months. Uh, if the uh, evaluator or your parole supervisor determines that that's not necessary anymore, then that can be changed, at least for the first six months. I want you to get out there and go to at least two AA meetings per week. That's my vote. I'm only one of three votes. Mr. Roche? Um, Mr. Coleman, my vote is the same for the same reasons. Electric incarceration long term medical issues. I will add one condition that you have occurred to you from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you. I, Ms. Coleman, I concur with my colleagues. My vote is to grant for the same reasons. Thank you. Coleman, you have three uh, votes to grant your parole. Your parole has been granted today to the Louisiana Parole Project with the conditions that we outlined. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome.
The Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 1229. Our next case is Mr. Charles Burns. Mr. Burns, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Charles Oliver Burns, 102959. Thank you, Mr. Burns. I'd like to explain our process mm -hmm. to you. Uh, I'm going to first, I'm going to read some information into the record, and the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. And at the appropriate time, uh, we will allow those persons who've indicated they wish to have input to speak. Uh, currently uh, speaking on your behalf today is a friend, Mr. Terrence Wynn, and another friend, Mr. Larry Thompson. Your sister, Sandra Thomas, is there with you, but she's uh, just there for support and won't be speaking. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. I do. This, this is the matter of Charles O. Burns, DOC number 102959. Mr. Burns' his date of birth is March the 26th of 1962. He's classified as a sixth felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of September the 1st of 2023. An adjusted good time date of August the 2nd of 2061, and a full term date of May the 1st of 2070. He is currently serving a 62 year sentence on the charge of two counts of attempted simple burglary and simple burglary after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, his habitual offender sentence was on March the 2nd of 2022. Mr. Burns, does all of that sound accurate to you? Yes, sir, it is. Mr. Burns, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson. She will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Burns. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. How old are you, Mr. Burns? I've just turned 61. And how much time have you actually served on this charge? 16 years. I'm showing 14, but you say 16? Oh, yeah, it's a total of 16. Um, <clears throat> you are classified as a sixth felony offender. You have priors for armed robbery, felony theft, forgery, simple burglary, and simple robbery. That sound about right? I, I've never had a simple robbery. Okay, was it attempted simple robbery? Because I did see that on your rap sheet. No, um, the, the last crime you committed, Mr. Burns, you were in your 40s. Yes, ma'am, I was. Why were you still committing burglaries in your 40s? Well, at the time, I had a substance abuse problem, and uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was on drugs. What kind, of, uh, what kind of drugs were you using? I was using cocaine. Um, when did you start using cocaine? Uh, in the early 2000s, probably about 2000. And um, how serious was your drug problem? Uh, it was serious enough to uh, get me to commit burglaries and, in, in, in essence, incarcerated. So I would say that was serious, but I... I uh, I had a serious drug problem. How often were you using? Uh, at least every other day at the most, every three days, maybe. Were you able to keep a job during that period? Yes, I was. I, I was able to stay employed. What kind of work did you do? I'm a welder by trade, a uh, welder. So you were a welder when you came into the prison? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was. Now, as I was looking over your prison record, um, you've only had one write-up, and that was in 2019. Um, that was a rule three, which is disobedient, and you got a reprimand for that. What what was that about? Well, I, I didn't get on the evening count. Uh, during count time, I wasn't included. And when there was, uh, uh, and I just didn't get on the count, uh, I thought the officer had included me. I was working at reentry chicken shack down there and she came through to count and I thought she recognized me, she didn't. And so that's how that came about. 
All right. Um, and I looked at your programs. You've done Cage Rage, Living in Balance, Thinking for Change, Free Release. Uh, you, uh, you're also a member or have been a member of the Lifers Club and Reentry. You've done the 12 step program and Malachi Dads. Your institutional record is good. And one of your supervisors say, said that you had a great work ethic. Um, you also have letters of commendation from prison enterprises, work supervisor, and from the reentry club, and you are a class C trustee. Is there anything else you would like to add to what I've just detailed about you that you think would be important for us to know? Well, as you stated, I have taken uh, uh, the steps to participate in the substance abuse uh, programs, AA, uh, sober group. Uh, they recently just started a, a narcotics anonymous uh, program. And so I've tried to strive to do the best that I could while I was incarcerated and take, uh, uh, take the opportunity to participate in all the programs and to combat my substance abuse. I knew it was a problem at the time. And so I really wanted to focus on uh, getting myself in position so that in the event I was released, I could be a plus to, to my community as opposed to a negative. What do you think it'll take for you to maintain your sobriety? Well, I, I, my plan is to, if, if released, to, uh, I have a list of uh, uh, meetings that will be held in my area. Uh, I have a, a directory, uh, the numbers of the directory. And what I'm, what I'm trying to get is that I am and I will be willing to uh, attend all meetings, you know, in my area and, and just try to keep my sobriety. I have 16 years in sobriety and I really want to maintain that. I have children now. I have children. I have grandchildren and I want to be there for them. I'm a council survivor. So I thank God for that. And I, I just feel that, I'm, I'm, that God kept me here for a reason. What's your, what's your transition plan? Where will you live? Where would you work? Well, uh, Proficient Refinishing has uh, agreed to give me a job. Uh, I will be living with my sister. And so I have somewhere to stay and I have uh, employment lined up. Uh, I don't know if you received the documentation from that business owner or not, but I do have a copy of it. I did receive that. And what kind of business is that? That is a refinishing business where they refinish, do refinishing work. And that's Finish, because, finishing what? Uh, you know, appliances, uh, countertops, bathtubs, things of that nature. Okay. What about your wealth trade? Well, I mean, that would be the job that I have lined up. But mm -hmm. in the event that I want some, uh, say, extra work or something, I will be willing to work as a welder. And I also have experience in powder coating. You saw that? Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, Warden, uh, what can you tell us about Mr. Um, Burns? So Mr. Burns is one of uh, our model uh, offenders. He has taken a, a pleasure of classes. He's working on a metal fab uh, plant right now, which we do license plates and stuff for the whole state of Louisiana. Um, the only other thing I can say that he has a high tiger score. Yeah, I saw that. Very, very confusing to That's me. Very, very confusing to me. All right. Well, thank you, uh, for Nambo. Um, all right. That's all I have. Thank you. Now we'll hear from uh, your supporters, Mr. Terrence Wynn. Hello, Hi, how is everyone doing? We're doing uh, well, Mr. Wynn, how are you? Please introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like uh, us to know. All right, I'm Terrence Wynn, Executive Director of PIPES. PIPES is an organization that was started when I left prison. And this uh, organization that's geared at helping people like Mr. Barnes come home and reacclimate themselves back into society. We also do job placement if, if possible. 
what I can say about Mr. Barnes is he, he's my auntie's best friend. And so, you know, he's been a part of my life. And I can say that he taught me I had an addiction problem when I was in prison. And my addiction was different than substance abuse. It was more towards cell phones. So I was one of the guys that often got caught up with phones. But talking to Mr. Burns, often, he, he, he made time because he knew me since I was a kid. He made time to talk to me about, man, if you want to go home, you got to do this. You got to do that. And, and you got to overcome what, you, uh, what you're going through. That's only if you want to go home and do the right thing. So I took his advice. And his advice has led me to speak for the United Nations once, and I'm going to speak for the United Nations again this month. And, you know, it's just, he's a guy that, I mean, I feel like you guys didn't make a mistake with me. Had I not had the board that I had and believed in me, I would have never had been able to come home and accomplish what I've accomplished thus far, with a lot more to accomplish. But Mr. Barnes, is, is a person that took he took a he took a lead in my life when I was a kid. I took the wrong road. When I came to prison, when when I was about to leave prison, he took a lead in my life and it helped me to come from prison because like I said, I had an addiction problem. I always had a I needed a cell phone. And by him overcoming his addictions, he gave me steps to overcome mine so that I could walk home. So my organization is is got open arms for him to come back into our city, put him in a role that, that he can help kids that's on the wrong path and that he can help adults that's, that's using drugs because we have a drug a drug uh, program a part, that's a part of our program. And so we have we have a spot for him. That's, if y'all feel it, feel it, that he should come home, we have a spot for him. And I know he'll be real, real good at helping people within our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Larry Thompson. Uh, that would be me. Okay, Mr. Thompson, why don't you tell us what you look? We can hear you from there. Right there. Stay right there and talk. All right. Uh, my name is Larry Thompson. I'm also the member of Pipes that uh, Terrence Wynn is our uh, president. And uh, all I can say about y'all, y'all is a good person because for I left here in 2018, I was serving a mandatory life sentence and it was charged advice that kept me on that straight path, get involved in program. You know, he was a, my mentor. And I released in uh, 2020, for 2018, and I released in 2018, and I worked at the Hilton Hotel, applying the uh, knowledge that I received from Charles. Once again, me and Charles worked at 915 Warehouse together, and he really wanted to slow me down, put me on the right path. I've been out five years, and I thank Charles for everything that he did. And uh, if you need help, then I'm, I'm there to help and support him. Mm -hmm. If you need me, then I'm there. If you need transportation, I have that. If you need a job, I can get him one at the hill to where I am maintenance engineering there. And, and, and conclusion, I want to say, Charlie, a good person. Hopefully, this honorable board will grant him the role this day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, sir. Mr. Burns. Is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes? Yes, sir. I have a closing statement, if I may read it, if, if it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. First and foremost, I would like to thank this board for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Also to my victim, the owner of the Valero convenience store that I burglarized. And I'm truly regretful for victimizing you and burglarizing your store. There is not a day that goes by without me feeling shame and remorse for offending you. When I was arrested for burglarizing your store, I was pretty much at the end of myself I was tired of my criminal behavior, so I embraced Jesus as, as my savior from my sin. And I made a promise to myself, my family, my friends, and my community that during my incarceration, I was going to do everything I could to become a better person through faith, education, substance abuse treatment, and life skills programming. And that is pretty much what I have done 
with my time in prison. Also to my community, family, law enforcement, and the judicial system, I apologize for the ripple effect that my past criminal and addictive behavior had on you all, for my past and negative behaviors. I will always be regretful and remorseful. Finally, for all the above reasons and many more, it is my prayer that this board will allow me the opportunity to return to society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burns. We appreciate your comments. And we ready to vote? Yes. Jackson? All right, Mr. Burns, uh, you had a very good interview today. I was very impressed with your words. Uh, you've done well during your incarceration. And so my vote, uh, because of four women you've had, your excellent disciplinary record, positive comments from prison officials and staff, um, my vote would be to grant uh, with the condition that you attend at least three AA meetings per week. Um, and um, abide by a 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. program. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Rusha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Barnes, based on positive remarks by Warren Ambo, good program, a great transition plan, and excellent work evaluations from prison enterprises, my vote is the same under the same conditions. Thank you, Mr. Rusha. Mr. Burns, you have two votes to uh, grant your parole uh, with certain conditions. I agree with my colleagues. My vote, likewise, is to grant your parole. Uh, you will have uh, three AA meetings per week. Uh, you must abide by 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. curfew. Uh, and I would hope that you do uh, uh, get with uh, your friends in the PIPES program. So good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all.
Committee on Parole is called back to order, but time is 12.49. Our next case is Mr. Bobby Jones. Mr. Jones, uh, would you please give me your full name and DOC number? Bobby Melvin Jones, 35-9474. Mr. Jones, I want to explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then the, the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those persons who indicate they have input uh, to speak. Uh, currently today, speaking on your behalf is Mr. Kerry Myers with the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, your sister, Ms. Thelma Jones, uh, Mr. Robert Lancaster, attorney uh, with a uh, law student, Mr. Ben MacArthur. Uh, at the end, uh, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process, sir? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Bobby Jones. DOC number 359474, date of birth, October the 25th of 1978. He's classified as a first felony offender. He is serving a life sentence on the charge of three separate counts of aggravated rape, uh, having been sentenced on October the 6th of uh, 1995. Is that all accurate, uh, Mr. Jones? Yes, sir. Mr. Jones, your case has been assigned to me. So, uh, I will begin our interview process, okay? Mr. Jones, uh, how old are you, sir? I can't hear you. How old? How old are you? 44 years old, sir. All right. Uh, can you hear me now okay? Is it something on yes, this sir. end? Yes, sir. I can speak louder. That my, my colleagues don't want me to speak louder, but I can speak louder. <laughs> uh, how long have you been in prison, Mr. Jones? Um, this is this would be me. I'm in my 29th year. 29th year. So how old were you when these offenses occurred? I was 16 years old. 16 years old. Tell me about uh, Mr. Bobby Jones at 16 years old. Were you in school? I was in school, but I I only went to school to, to do wrong. I got to be honest with you. I, I wasn't doing right in school. Uh, at 16 years old, were you doing drugs or drinking? I was drinking heavy. I used to mix drinks and I used to do drugs also. Okay, what kind of drugs were you using? I was I was smoking loaded marijuana. That's when okay. you that's when you take marijuana and you lace it with other drugs. In my case, I used to smoke marijuana laced with cocaine and formaldehyde. And how how early did you start doing that? What age were you? When you first started doing that? I had just turned 15 when I started doing that. But I had been mixing my drinks. I, I mixed four, four different drinks together every time. And I, it became a regular thing for me. I used to mix Wild Irish Rose, Night Train, MD 2020, and Vodka. And that was my everyday thing. And what was your living environment? You were living with your older sister, is that right? Yes, sir. And she's the mother of the three victims in this case? No, sir. My oldest, my, my second to the oldest sister is Thelma, the one that's on the Zoom right now. She was my legal guardian. My oldest okay. sister is the mother of the, the children that's involved. Good girl. Okay. So you were living with another sister at the time? Right. Okay. Yes, so who else was living in that house with you? It was me, my sister Thelma, her two twin boys, my other sister, Mabel, and my brother, Calvin. So tell me, tell me how it happened that uh, over this period of time, you had sex with these three, two girls and, and, and boy. Tell me about it. Um, what led up to it was that I was in a very dark place, sir, and I experienced something that it really messed me up. I watched my mom die when I was 11 years old. I didn't know how to handle that. And it led me to start using. I was only trying to stop from seeing what I saw. Every day I would relive my mom passing away. And I just wanted to make it stop. I just went about it the wrong way. I, I I I can't, I don't even know how it even got that far. 
Now these these children were under twelve years old, weren't they? Weren't they young children? Yes, sir. They was. Now how did how did this start? How did you how did it happen that you began to have sexual relations with all three of these children over a period of time? I can't remember, but I I do know that it was on two separate occasions. However, the, like I I really can't remember the details, but I take full responsibility for what I've done. I'm not denying it. I was wrong, and I am sorry. Uh, let, let, yeah, go ahead. I'm, let, let me let I, you finish. I sincerely apologize to my victims. I, I, I regret what I've done, and I'm ashamed of what I've done. But I do, have, do, you have, do you have any relationship with your sisters now or anyone else in your family? Yes, my sister Thelma, my sister Maple, I, I talk to them regularly. So let's talk about what you've done while you've been in prison. Tell me uh, what are some of the things that you believe have been most effective on you to have you recognize wrong that you did and and be able to help you heal and understand it and make sure that it doesn't happen again. So tell me what you've learned or what things have impressed you the most while you've been in prison. Well, it, it was a couple of programs that it that really had a, a major effect on my life. Um, victim awareness. I don't under, I don't know what the process for getting in victim awareness now, but when I went through it. You couldn't get in unless you was willing to accept full responsibility for your crime. And that was like my moment of epiphany. That was my wake up call. That was when I stopped being in denial. That is when I, I just, you know, I accepted it. And I start from there. I, I tried my best to make amends. It was it was no more denying it because it's like every program that I took, I couldn't get around it. So I understand that accepting full responsibility for my crime was the only avenue that I had to change. There was no way I could change if I did not accept full responsibility for what I've done. And that had a great impact on me. Another class that had a great impact on me was risk management, sex offense treatment program. In that program, the whole thing basically deal with how not to offend again. They give you all the tools. It's 27 risk factors. The one that stood out the most is the um high um the high risk. When you are in a high risk situation, it teaches you how to recognize it. A high risk situation, according to the program, is any situation that you place yourself in or that others place you in where you have access to a victim. So, um, and, and can I give an example of a high risk situation? Sure. Yeah. An example of a high risk situation, with if, if I was um, hungry and I, and I stepped into a McDonald's and it had like six people in line and the sixth person was a minor, I wouldn't get in line behind the minor. I would go sit down and let somebody else get in line and then I would get in line. I wouldn't have no access to a victim or potential victim. Ask him to state that again for you, please. Ask him to say something, please. Speak. Hello? Uh, Ms. Yeah. Speak this way because the, the computer's restarting, so speak this way towards the speaker. Okay. And just ask him to restate that. Oh, Mr. Jones, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Mr. Jones, uh, you cut off when you give an example of uh, the risk, the, the high risk factor, okay? One of the risk factors. Could you repeat that to us, please? I said an example of a high risk situation uh, would, would be if I went into a restaurant to get something to eat and they had like five people in line and the fifth person in line was a minor, I wouldn't get in line behind the minor. I would go sit down and wait till the line go down or wait till someone else get in line and then I would get in line. I wouldn't I wouldn't be nowhere near. Uh, 
you took also, you took banking for a change. Are you currently in banking for a change? You were in banking for a change when I read the report. Have you finished that program yet? No, I'm not finished yet. I got like four more weeks, but I am currently taking it. And banking for a change is it deal with correcting thinking errors. The four main areas of thinking for a change is your thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs. You know, I corrected my thinking error. One of my thinking errors was thinking that every time something happened, it was always somebody else's fault. But now I realize that in any situation I find myself in, it's for something that I did or something that I failed to do. It's my fault. Mr. Jones, uh, it looks like in October of 2009, you got your GED, right? Yes, sir. Tell me, I, I'm not sure I know what C H A N G E is. Uh, change, change, uh, change or something. Tell me what that is. Change means cultivating human abilities necessary for growth, enhancement, and development. That is that is that is the name of the Islamic group that I'm a part of in a Angola right now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. And can you see us now? Yeah, we. I can see you now. Okay. Tell me about the group change. Tell me your role in it and tell me what it does. Well, I used to be the vice president of change. Change is actually um, an Islamic group. It's the faith-based group that I'm a part of in the prison. And we have a young men's pro program. I'm also a teacher in that program every Monday night and Friday night and the education building. Um, the purpose of the teach, the classes that I teach, you have a lot of guys that come into the religion of Islam and they don't really know. So before we allow them to, you know, go around thinking that it's some type of radical religion, that's why I step in and teach them what the religion is all about. When, when did you take the uh, sex offender treatment program? Uh, in between 2009-2010. Now, you got a uh, you got a write-up in 2018. And the write-up basically had to do with uh, you making sexual remarks to another offender's mother who had a young girl with her during visitation. Tell me about that. Tell me what was going on there. Tell me about that. Well, it was it was a simple misunderstanding. I take full responsibility for my actions. I, I hear that, but tell me specifically what is it that you said and what is it that you meant to convey? Well, she, she didn't say I said it. Her son said that I told his mama something about some nuts or something in the visiting shed. And when I was approached about it, I was approached about it by the warden. I explained to the warden at the time. So what explain to me what it is you did. Tell me what you did. Well, I had asked her, her daughter, when they got some wet peanuts that they sell in the visiting shed, and I didn't know they sold them. And I asked her, I said, you really like those? And she said, yeah. And she gave me one. And she said, here, try one. So I tried one. And when the sun came in, I got up and told him, y'all have a nice day. And I left. A week and a half le later, I got a call from the warden's office to come to the warden office. And that was the complaint against me. Uh, but I, I take full responsibility for it because I didn't even have to go on the floor. So... I'm sorry for that, and I take full responsibility for that. That was on me. Mr. Mr. Jones, let, let me ask you, in your, in, in your education and your learning through uh, your sex offender treatment, have, have you come to grips with the fact of what you did? And the reason I'm, 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 I'm trying to formulate a, a, a question, I guess, and that is you were 16 years old. Yes, sir. These children were young, but they weren't that much younger than you. 
have, have you learned that maybe you have uh, an affinity for younger children or whether this was something, what have you learned about yourself in this crime that you, you committed? I learned that I had these thinking errors and I needed help. I don't, I don't think that it was, you know, a want for younger people or nothing like that, because when I committed this, this ax, I was high out of my mind. I was high. I, I got to admit it. I was, I was on drugs and I was drinking. And this is just a, a unfortunate situation. You know, I don't know what, I don't know how that even come about. I don't even know how I even let that go that far. Like, I don't, I don't know what made me go to that point. However, I did, and I take full responsibility for it. And I'm, I apologize to my victims. I sincerely apologize. I regret what I've done, and, and I'm ashamed of what I've done. I know you're going to the Louisiana Parole Project if you are granted parole. What's your plan beyond that? Well, considering that drugs and alcohol played a, a ma major part, I've um I've asked my attorneys to get with the parole project with Mr. Karen Myers to find out where is the nearest AA clinic where I'll be residing at in um New Orleans because I don't want to go backwards. You know, I want to be in the clinic where I can go and have somebody to talk to and even possibly start instructing classes myself. This is my, you know, plan to stay sober, to not go backwards and, and to take the things that I learned in my sex offense treatment class to never offend again. Warden, what can you tell us about Mr. Jones? So, uh, <clears throat> Did you read the report that he got um, in the visiting room? Did you you understood it clearly? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. I, I read it. I heard what he said. I read the report. It, it they seemed to be at odds with each other, but uh, I heard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, do you have any other information besides the report as it was written? Uh, no, I just have it as the investigation was written. Okay. Yes, sir. So other than what he said and, and the things y'all talk about, I really have nothing else to add to it. Thank you, Gordon. Well. Okay, now we'll hear from uh, your supporters, uh, Mr. Kerry Myers. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, should Mr. Jones be granted parole, Mr. Jones will um, go to his aunt uh, Lula Mae Brown in New Orleans. Um, you will note from the package that was submitted uh, that there are other per registered persons in that area. So that area has already already been vetted. Uh, obviously, it would still have to be approved by PNP. There would be no no point in, in having to do dual registration fees by being residential in our program and then moving a, a month later to, to New Orleans. Again, we'll, our, we'll provide uh, case management services uh, through our, our New Orleans uh, case manager uh, for Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Myers. Ms. Thelma Jones? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ms. Jones. I just want to say that um, I have kept in touch with my younger brother, Bobby Jones, uh, through phone calls and letters while in prison, while he's in prison. And I'm very proud of the man he has become. Uh, he is more mature and he has shown that he understands the depths of his offenses and he has set out to become a better man. I have witnessed the changes he's made and his growth in the way he speaks and in the ideas that he shares. His maturity from a 16 year old young man to the man that he is now is very clear to me. I believe based on what he has shared with me that he is very remorseful for what he done to my nephew, Ronnie, my niece, Javander, and my niece, Candace, who I love very much. And he has taken full responsibility for his actions. 
I support, I support my brother Bobby because he has taken advantage of rehab programs while in prison and he has obtained his GD and he's just demonstrated a willingness to become a better person. He has put in the work to change and he has my full support for re-entry into society if granted. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Lancaster, if uh, you would introduce uh, Mr. MacArthur. And Good afternoon, Robert Lancaster with the LSU Parole and Reentry Clinic here today representing Bobby Jones. Uh, with me is Ben MacArthur, second year student at the Law Center enrolled in the clinic. As a second year student, Mr. Uh, MacArthur is not certified under Louisiana Supreme Court Rule 20. He's worked with Mr. Jones in preparation of today's hearing, also prepared the packet that was submitted to the committee in advance of this hearing, and with the uh, uh, committee's permission, can make a statement of support. Right. Thank you, Mr. Lancaster. Uh, Mr. MacArthur, we'll get to you in just a second. Mr. Jones, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before uh, Mr. MacArthur closes out for you? I just, again, I just want to, I sincerely apologize to my victims. And I take full responsibility for what I've done. I'm not the same 16-year-old adolescent who com committed this horrible crime. You know, I've changed. My programming that I've been through worked for me. It taught me a lot of th things. More importantly, it, it, it showed me the error in my ways. And I'm just asking that, you know, I, I be judged by the man that I have become because of my, my program. I've changed. I'm not the same guy. I, in fact, I will never be that guy ever again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. McArthur? Yes, uh, thank you, members of the board. Um, as the science of, you know, the human brain and emotional development has uh, developed, um, it's showed that juveniles are different from adults in terms of how they, um, you know, control their, emo their ability to control their emotions regulate their behavior is not as fully formed as an adult, but also their potential for reform and rehabilitation is much higher than an adult offender. And the courts have recognized this, the Louisiana legislature has recognized this with constitutional amendments, with statutes, and this parole board with its own board directives has recognized this as well. Um, Mr. Jones was incarcerated when he was 16 years old he was raised in a negative environment. He had an extreme substance abuse problem. But since his incarceration, he's taken the steps to understand and change those underlying issues. Um, you know, he's taken levels one, two, and three of risk management. He signed up for level four facilitation class and uh, can finish that as a condition of his uh, parole release. Um, he's taken victim awareness. He's been in Alcoholics Anonymous, many others. He's facilitated programs, he's worked as a re-entry mentor, and he's held positions of leadership in the Islamic community. Um, if he's released, he'll have the support of his aunt. The parole project will provide any necessary re-entry programming. Um, he'll be provided with a home. And he's also, he has employment lined up waiting for him. And uh, he also plans to be active in Alcoholics Anonymous and the Islamic community if released. And Mr. Jones just, Ask, respectfully ask this committee to look at him as the 44-year-old man he is today and not the 16-year-old that he was, you know, 28, 29 years ago. Thank, Thank you, you Martha. Uh, Mr. Jones, are you currently in phase four uh, of the sex offender treatment program or are you signing up for that? Is that something you are? I've signed up and they say I should start next week. Okay, and you're currently in thinking for a change. You got about a couple more weeks to do that. Four more weeks of thinking for a change, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now we're ready to vote. Yes. Okay. Mr. Jones, uh, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed our interview. You've been very honest uh, with us. Uh, you know, you've been in prison for 29 years. You came to prison as a 16 year old boy. Yes, sir. Committed a horrible offense. There's no question about that. When you were 16, that's uh, 
you've come a long way from that 16 year old boy who was a drug addict, who had a uh, very difficult uh, background to, to cope with. You've gotten uh, your GED, you've taken some, some very good classes, you obviously are aware and very remorseful for the crime that you've committed. You have helped others while you've been in prison. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to accept you at your word for the comments that you made on the, the write-up you got 2018. I'm just simply going to point you back to remembering those uh, uh, trigger points that you need to make sure, those, those uh, points that you need to stay away from, comments that, uh, uh, you know, you're going to be under a cloud for the rest of your life. So you need to make sure that you don't make foolish comments like that or comments that might be misinterpreted uh, as perhaps this one was at that time. So based upon all of those things, based upon the comments by the ward and based upon your transition plan, based upon the support you have from family, it would be my, my vote to grant your parole conditionally upon your completing, uh, thank you for a change, Enrolling in and completing phase four of the uh, sex offender treatment program. Yes, sir. After that, then being under the supervision or the, the uh, guidance of uh, the Louisiana Parole Project, uh, also three AA meetings per week. And uh, those are my conditions. The, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the other board members to vote. And if they vote similarly, they may add conditions as well. So uh, that's my vote. I'm only one of three. Mr. Roche? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jones, uh, my vote is the same. Grant upon completion of phase four of the sex offender treatment and thinking for a change. And the conditions are the same as Mr. Mayor Bellis. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Roche. Mr. Jackson? And I concur, Mr. Jones. My vote is the same. Mr. Jones, you have three votes to uh, uh, grant your parole conditioned upon your finishing, uh, thanking for a change, and uh, enrolling in completing phase four of the sex offender treatment, uh, three AA meetings per week, and follow the recommendations of the Louisiana Parole Project. Good yes. luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Carthy, good job, sir. Thank you.
The Committee on Parole is called back to order. The time is 1.23. Our next case is Mr. Wilbert Meredith. Mr. Meredith, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? Wilbert Meredith, 120505. Thank you, Mr. Meredith. Let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. Excuse me. And we will then allow the participants. Uh, then we're going to conduct a parole interview with you. And then we'll allow those persons who wish to have input to speak. After that, you'll have an opportunity to say anything you'd like to say before the board votes. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. This is uh, Mr. Wilbert J. Meredith. DOC number 120505, date of birth, September the 7th, 1965. He's a fourth class felony offender. He is uh, serving a life sentence. He is not entitled to good time. And he is uh, serving a life sentence for negligent homicide, purse snatching, having been revoked, and armed robbery after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, Mr. Uh, Meredith, is that information pretty accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, Meredith, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson. She will begin our interview process. Well, let me, let me uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I missed the participants. We have uh, currently uh, present with you, but not speaking, is Ms. Latasha Meredith and Ms. Precious Meredith. Uh, speaking in opposition is Ms. Katherine Johnson. So uh, we do have uh, at least one speaker today. So uh, would you please answer Ms. Jackson's questions? All right, good afternoon, Mr. Meredith. Mm -hmm. How are you? All right. That's good. Uh, Mr. Meredith, there's some uh, things I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Uh, you're 56 years old, is that correct? 57. Seven. And how long have you been incarcerated? 20, 25 years. Now, uh, one of the charges that you're serving time on happened uh, while you were already incarcerated. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That was the negligent homicide, is that yes, correct? Yes, ma'am. And how much time did you receive on the negligent homicide? Two years. So have you completed that sentence? Yes, ma'am. So you're only serving time now on the uh, purse snatching and the armed robbery or just the armed robbery? The armed robbery. Okay. And that was a help. And that's the life sentence where you were treated as an habitual offender. Is that yes, correct? Ma yes, ma'am. I had information that you're a fifth offender. However, um, perhaps your master prison record said that you're a fourth offender. Um, tell me. Uh, When did you first go to prison for the first time? And on for what? The, on, on the first time, or when I first came to Angola? No, the first time. Of uh, uh, auto theft. And how old were you? I was, I was, uh, I was like eighteen. And when did you first come to Angola? I was twenty-two. And what and that was for what charge? The on robbery. So tell me when you're starting at 18 up until the time you uh, started serving this uh, life sentence for the on robbery, what was going on with you? Why were you uh, committing so many crimes? At that time, I, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I was all uh, going, getting in, following the wrong people, getting in trouble with the, uh, following the lead, a crew, a crew of people at the time. And why, why did you choose that? Why did you choose to follow that crowd of people? 
well, I, that's at, at that age I was, I was, I, 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 I ain't had nowhere to, uh, nobody to teach me nothing at the time, no learn nothing. I, I was, I, I raised up without a father, and it took me. I, I, I fought, had friends that I was growing up with. You know, we was, I, I like, I was into balling, but now that I've grown out, I've been in, incarcerated for these times. I don't. How far did you go in school before you came? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. And why did you only go to the sixth grade? I did. At the time, I was all. Uh, I was a bad student, a bad, uh, a bad person at the time. You mean a bad person? No. Yeah. Didn't didn't have it. It didn't have it in my. Didn't feel going to school. I, I didn't have it on my mind. I was just getting in trouble at the time. How old were you when you finally dropped out of school in the sixth grade? I was like, oh, about 11 or, 11 or 11 at that age, 11. Who were you living with? My, my mother. She just let you stop going to school at age 11? No, my mother had to work. Well, even so. And she didn't know what I was doing at the time. She didn't know you weren't bringing home report cards? Well, at that time, no, no ma'am. Okay. Um, have you ever had a, a, a job? A yes, ma'am. What kind of job? Did you have in the prison? A dish in the in the prison? No. I I working at the dishwasher at Ralph and Cat Coon. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about uh, the last twenty five years. I noticed that you've not been able to get your GED. Um, and that you've taken literacy classes a number of times. Um, are you currently enrolled in literacy classes? Yes, ma'am. And uh, tell us, uh, can you read? A little bit. And so you struggled with uh, reading, which is why you haven't been able to get your GED? Yes, ma'am. Um, and how long have you been enrolled in literacy this time? Oh, three years. Have you made any progress? No, ma'am. It goes up and go back down. Okay. Also, you had quite a few write-ups. You had 90 write-ups um, since you've been there. That's a pretty high number. Why did why were you having so many write-ups? Back then, you know, it, it, the write-ups that I was getting, you uh, you had to get them, you know. Yeah. What do you mean you had to get them? Oh, uh, you had to you had to fight when I first come here. Okay. Well, uh, you had a write-up in uh, 2016. And one in 2020. You remember the one in 2016? No, no ma'am, not that. Do you remember the one in 2020? Uh, that was a simple fight in 20. And why were you fighting? You know how we get uh, to us, get it, we get it, start playing with each other, fussing and all, and then lay it up into a fight. Or a simple fight, plain. Well, tell me, um, tell me what happened. I know you finished the time on the charge, but tell me what happened that led to you getting a negligent homicide. Well, I hit him. I hit him. He had a little argument on the card game, and I hit him, and he had a blood clot. So why did you hit him? Because some you uh, if I wouldn't hit him, he'd hit me. Well, I mean, how do you know that? We both was went swung at the same time. 
taken anger management? Yes, ma'am. Twice. Twice? Yes, ma'am. The last time you took it? I took it uh, in, in 18 and uh, in 20, something like 20. Yeah, well, it looks like you didn't do you much good because you got ridden up for fighting in 20. Yeah, that's after the fight. Well, but not 18. 18. Said you took it twice, 18 and Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I took it so twice. Before the fight. <laughs> right? Yes, ma'am. So why didn't you use what you learned in anger management to just let it go, walk away? Why you didn't use what you had already learned? Well, I tried to do that, but we know it, it, it didn't work. What do you mean you tried to do it? I tried to walk away from it, but it, it from was what? from the fight, the first beginning, we, we just, and then it, it kept following. And, and, I, and, and that's when it happened. Do you have a job at the prison? Yes, ma'am. your job at A dorm audit. How long have you had that job? Two years. Okay. What other kind of job have you had? I had a uh, 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 kitchen worker, dishwasher, <laughs> manufacturer. Have you, are you a trustee or have you ever been a trustee? Yes, ma'am. Are you a trustee now? No, oh, ma'am. Why, why not? It, they took it for the, because I had a guy in altercation. The same one, the same yes. one you're talking about or a different one? Yes, ma'am, the same one. And how long had you been a trustee before you lost that um, status? From, from 09 to uh, 14, 15. Okay. So if you were to be successful today, uh, Mr. Meredith, tell us what your plan is. My plan is to get out here to help my mother and my father, help my mother and my sisters, help my mother and my sister and get me a job and, and, and okay. still work. That's fine. I mean, I don't know what you mean by helping your mother and father, but again, where are you gonna live? Where are you going to work? How are you going to pay bills? I have a brother that's going to provide me a place to stay until I get on my feet to get yeah. on my Where is that? That's on, in New Orleans East. Okay. And uh, what kind of work are you going to be able to do? Well, I have an uncle that helped me a, a job at a standing still in, in Slidell. And what? It's a standing seal car washing job. He's going to provide me with, with give me a job at that. You pick up any um, job skills while you're in prison? By the offender. Okay. How did you, where did you learn that or how did you learn that? I learned that by working in, in the body the offender shop. Okay. Did you take a class for that or you were just working there? I learned that through the skit by going over there. I, I got a certificate, a, a, a certificate in my folder for that. Okay. Uh, what did you get out of thinking for change? I see you took thinking for change. What'd you get out of that? Do you remember anything they taught you? I had thinking for change, being able to think things over before acting on it. Give me something specific. Everybody can figure that out. You should think before you act. Not be so angry at 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 all at it at at at, the, at nothing. Uh, when did you take thinking for a change? You remember? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, what about living in balance? What you learn in living in balance? Living. 
I don't remember recall. I know I took them uh, trades, but I don't remember. Living in balance is a substance abuse program. Oh yeah, a substance abuse. I learned a lot of substance abuse, how to control my anger and not do alcohol, drink alcohol or drugs, do drugs. Tell me some, remember anything specific, anything in particular you will learn that would help you uh, to do those things when you got out? Stay in church, go, trust in God. Just help around, do things for God. Let God give me what he want me to do. Uh, Warren, what can you tell us about Mr. Meredith? Um, basically, you went through everything. Uh, he did do anger management twice and substance abuse. Uh, and, he was, <laughs> and he has a low tiger. Um, and uh, you have the report on the, the fight that he had. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. That's all. Thank you. Yes, trust me. Uh, Mr. Merrick, good afternoon. How you doing, sir? Good. Why do you have difficulty following instructions? Well, I, at, well I'll say that again, sir. Why do you have trouble following instructions and doing what you're supposed to do? Well, I, 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 I always follow instructions. At this, then why, then why, in twenty sixteen, you were assigned to the working cell block five times? No, I, I only went to the. Oh, uh, sir, let, let me let me read you what I have, and maybe it can be corrected. Uh, right up number eighty five. Number 10 for fighting. You were assigned to a working cell block. Right up 86, aggravated work offense. You were assigned to the, you were assigned to the working cell block. Right up 87, aggravated work offense. You were assigned to the working cell block. 88 and 89, the same thing. Aggravated work offense, and you were assigned to the working cell block. The fight, you were found guilty, and you were in five days disciplinary segregated court. Let me ask my question again. Right. Why do you have trouble following instructions? In arms. I was young at that time, sir. At that time, I was young. When I, with the time that you're talking about the writer, that there, I was young. I was, I didn't, I came in the prison. It was violent. It was, it, it was rough then. Sir, sir, I'm talking about 2016, only seven years ago. Oh, I don't recall them write ups though. I, I, I don't remember them write ups there. I don't remember. Okay. I, I just want to know because, you know, very rarely do I see an offender assigned to a working cell block on number 28, which is aggravated work offense. But you were assigned to a working cell block five times in 2016. And I just want to know why. In 2016, five times, I was, I, I remember I went to block one time, one time, and I was in that block at that time. Okay, Warren, Warren, is my information incorrect? No, sir, your, your information is correct, but on two of those occasions that he was uh, sentenced to the working cell block, it was uh, suspended for 30 days. So he got two 30-day suspensions, but then when he got the next 28 on 10, 20, uh, 16, it was, uh, Impose the working cell block. But uh, that's the 88 and 89th report. Okay. Uh, Warren, can you get the classification officer to explain exactly under what act 
he became parole eligible because he has a life sentence. I don't see any commutation of sentence. And I just like to know exactly under what statute he became eligible for parole. Under Act 469. He's okay. in, yeah, he's under Act 469, which he was multi bill um, under Act, uh, his multi bill was what they call, they used crimes that were not effective to multi bill. Therefore, 469 made him become parole eligible. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, now we'll hear uh, from the opposition, Ms. Catherine Johnson. Johnson, can you hear us? Hello, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can. Would you please introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like us to hear? Thank you. My name is Catherine Miller Johnson. Um, my brother was Raleigh B. Miller who was an inmate there in which um, we finally find out when we got information about the uh, victim's family, what really happened to him. We never really knew what happened. We never really knew. We never knew anything about Mr. Meredith receiving um, the sentence of voluntary manslaughter. So we never knew any of this. But my question to Mr. Meredith is... Ma'am, you, you need to direct your comments to us. We, this is not a dialogue. Okay. Meredith. I, I understand you probably want some information. But we have to follow our procedures, okay? That's okay. That's, that's fine. This is my first time ever having to do anything of this nature. So that's fine. Um, I guess uh, the main thing to me is, um, and she just explained about it. First he was on um, without parole and now the poss life, and now he has the possibility of parole. So I don't know how that works or what happened for the change to come about. Did she say something about a certain time in which he was incarcerated? Yes, ma'am. The legislature apparently uh, there are several ways that, that our system works and the case gets to us. Uh, the legislature enacts new laws sometimes that make people who weren't otherwise eligible for parole to be eligible for parole. And apparently the act that the classification officer just cited is the statute under which uh, Mr. Meredith now finds himself eligible for a parole hearing. So if he is granted parole, when, how long before he's released or if he is released? Well, if he's granted parole today, he could be released relatively soon. Now, he'll be under parole supervision until the end of his term. But uh, he could be granted, uh, if he is granted parole today, he could be released, uh, depending on what his conditions are, he could be released relatively soon. Okay. Okay. Well, on behalf of my family and what we've had to go through, um, I won't say that I don't think he doesn't deserve something, but two years for manslaughter. So he, he got two years for killing someone. Uh, apparently, ma'am, the records that you see are basically what we see. We we had nothing to do with that. That is that that was a whole court system that that ultimately came to us in these records. Apparently, it was a negligent homicide that was uh, the charge was ultimately negligent homicide. And he got a two year sentence. It could have been a murder. It could have been a manslaughter. Uh, but it ultimately ended up being a, a negligent homicide. 
I don't know. I don't know that we know really what all the facts were, except that that's the charge that ultimately resulted, and his ultimate sentence was a two-year sentence. Right. Well, I, I guess you 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 have access to the records. Like I said, we never could get any information, access, or anything. So we just kind of got uh, pushed to the side. Yes, ma'am. It. it I apologize, and I'm sorry that you didn't get the information you were looking for. Uh, we're a separate entity. We're we're the parole board, uh, and uh, I'm sorry that that you didn't get the information. But uh, you are here today to voice your opposition to his being paroled, and we understand that. Separate. Okay, I I I get it. Uh, I get it. Um... I guess if I had a little bit more information other than what I've heard, but um, my niece was trying to get in and she wasn't able to eat her, my brother's daughter, she wasn't able to get into the Zoom meeting so she could hear or, you know, participate in any of this activity, so. Um, I'm sorry, I... I... That's all the information that I have to give you about the facts of that particular case. Okay. Well, that I guess almost puts us back where we were, maybe 10% a little bit. Because from listening to this, at least I know a few things. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed your name. Catherine. All right, all right, Ms. Catherine. Um... I don't want you to leave this hearing feeling, you know, that you didn't know what you needed to know. Uh, I was a judge for 28 years, and basic what negligence design means is that uh, you don't intend to cause the harm that resulted. So if you, um, you know, punch somebody one time and they fall and they hit their head and as a result of hitting your head, they suffer some trauma that leads to their death. Nobody expects that if you hit a person one time that that's going to cause their death or great bodily harm. So it's, you know, negligent homicide is an unintentional act. It brings about some unintended consequences. So, you know, negligent homicide means you didn't intend to cause the harm, but you did the act that ultimately caused the harm. But, you know, you know, if you were on top of a person repeatedly beating them and beating them and beating them and they died, then sure, that's a different thing. You hit somebody one time and they fall, they hit their head, or they have some underlying condition that you had no you know, reason to expect that that would be the outcome. That would explain why a charge would be a negative. Does that help any? It does. It, it, uh, it clears up the meaning, but um, it still doesn't satisfy I still don't have a true and I would even like to see documents to read the documentation you know that kind we of thing. I know that's that's not your area okay well again I just want you to at least have a little bit more insight okay sounds good okay right. thank you very much Ms. Johnson appreciate you thank you for the opportunity Baron is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes You no, no, sir. All right. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Marriott, um, I'm really worried about a lot of things related to your case. I really am. Uh, I'm certainly uh, concerned about the anger issues that you have and how even after going through anger management twice, because I show that the last time you did anger management was in 2019, and that last write-up 
fighting was in 2020. So I just feel like you you sit in programs. I just don't get the feeling that you're getting a whole lot out of the program. The programs aren't going into you. You're just sitting in the room. Now, it may be because you have some issues with literacy. You may have some learning disabilities, and I understand that. But I am concerned about the number of disciplinary write-ups that you had. Uh, I'm concerned about um, just... Just your overall lack of progress over the last 25 years. I, I don't know that you've changed a whole lot in 25 years. And I feel like somebody makes you mad. Your first impulse is going to be to fight because that's how you always handle it. And I, I, don't, I don't think that you have tools right now that you need to be successful when you get out. So, uh, ma'am, no, ma'am, uh, I would like to see you, you know, get some more programming, but also to take it seriously to try to get as much out of it as you can. Because so far, it just seems to me you've been sitting in there because you know you can get some credit for it, but I don't see that you're really trying to apply what you're learning to become better and to be able to get out in the world and be successful. Now, your day is going to come, but I just don't believe for me that that day is today. So my vote today would be to deny uh, based on your um, disciplinary record and your overall institutional record. But I'm going to encourage you not to give up. I'm glad you're still in literacy. Keep working at that. But I just don't think today is the day. I'm just one vote. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor, based on your prior criminal history, Express opposition from the victim's family and law enforcement, your disciplinary conduct, and a need for additional programming for our abilities to deny your request. Mr. Mayor, if you have two votes to deny your parole, uh, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, my vote would be the same. Uh, your parole has been denied today, but with encouragement to Work harder in those classes that you take. Good luck to you.
The committee on parole is called back to order. The time is 2.06. Our next case is Mr. Travis Rogers. Mr. Rogers, would you please give us your full name and DOC number? Travis Rogers, 375-301. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, this is the case of uh, Mr. Travis Rogers, 375-301. Mr. Rogers, uh, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow the participants who've indicated they wish to speak to have their input. At the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our procedure? Yes, sir. Uh, those are speaking here on your behalf today are Mr. Kerry Myers, who's president with the Louisiana Parole Project. Mr. Robert Lancaster, uh, his uh, attorney is here, and Mr. Jackson Andrus, who is a law student with Mr. Lancaster, is here speaking on your behalf. Uh, you have other people here uh, wishing to speak. Uh, Caius uh, Burbank, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name. Uh, Chrissy Burbank and Matthew Nellen. You also have Mr. Ronald Olivier, Ms. Chrissy Burbank. Uh, Mr. Henry Davis, Mr. Tiffany Davis, uh, Mr. Donald, who is your uncle, Anthony Hatcher, Derek Rogers, Justin Singleton, Daisy Rogers, and Diamond McRae, who are observers uh, today. Uh, do you understand our process? Yes, sir. All right, this is uh, Travis Rogers, 375-301, date of birth. 12-18-1972. He's a first-time felony offender, first-class felony offender. He has a parole eligibility date of December the 18th, 2017, and adjusted good time date of, of uh, July 14th of 2070, full term date of December the 27th of 2070. He is currently serving a 75-year sentence on the charges of armed robbery and manslaughter. Mr. Uh, Rogers, is that basically correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Rogers, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. To my left, Mr. Roche will begin our questioning. Would you please answer any questions he might have? Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Rogers. How you doing? Nice, nice, to, see you. nice to see you again. Yes, sir. I was on your last panel in August of 2020. Do you remember? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's get started. Um, look like you, what, you're currently 50 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you are first felony offender and you've been incarcerated for approximately 27 years and five months, is that correct? Yes, sir. And this is a re-hearing. Your last hearing was in August of 2020, about two and a half years ago, and you were denied by a vote of two to one. Two members voted to grant, and one member voted to deny. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you were denied based on you, you had not earned a GED and you were not eligible for a two thirds vote. Is that correct? Yes, sir. My vote was I granted based on uh, good time programs completed, a low risk assessment, and you received outstanding remarks by Warren Bernard. And my conditions upon release was that you must find you must find a good permanent transition plan and you must complete your GED. Remember that? Yes, sir. Have you completed your GED? No, sir. Well, I passed everything, Mr. Roche. But it's a 45 total score, but I'm at a 43. Okay, all right. Uh, what subject gave you trouble? Reading. I passed it though, but I'm, I, I could take any subject I want to get the two points 
that I need to get me to the 45. Okay, sounds good. When are you planning on doing that? Whenever, whenever the test allows me to do it. Whenever they allow me to take the test. Okay. Well, I think I think they'll allow you to take it because my vote is probably gonna be the same thing if everything is, is, is the same as it was in August of 2020. But again, I will put a condition that you must complete your GED before you release. Yes, sir. So let's get started. Uh, tell me about the program you completed since your last hearing. Since my last hearing, I completed Mind, Art, and Substance, a workbook, Introduction to Treatment, a workbook, Abused and Wounded Men, a workbook, Criminal and Addictive Thinking, Trauma Healing Institute, A Young Man's Guide to Self Mastery, Mind Alter Substance One and Two, Sober Group Alcohol Anomics. That's it. And the STAR program. Yes, sir. And a STAR program that's been very, very instrumental in my life with Ms. Lori Stone, who's been my mentor, who's going to allow me to get an AA, NA, and get, get into a speaking engagement to at-risk youths, because I have a desire to speak to at-risk youths so I can prevent them from making that one bad decision that could lead to a lifetime incarceration. Okay, now, I see <clears throat> that you just finished the opioids treatment program in January 2023. Yes, sir. You plan to take the shot upon release? Yes, sir. I'm on, I'm on the pill right now, but yes, sir. I, I, I would prefer the shot too. Yes, sir. Tell me about any organizational participation since the last year. Any organizations? Yeah. But as far as clubs or anything? Yes. Sir? Well, well, I've just been instrumental dealing with the STAR program. Every day, what, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we go to STAR program, to the STAR class. And from there, I go to school. Okay, so you've been busy. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any community service? No, sir. Okay. Uh, your last write-up, last hearing was September 2009. Is that still true? Yes, sir. So you haven't had any write-ups in the last 14 years? No, sir. Outstanding. Now, last hearing, you did have opposition. The law enforcement opposition, you can't do anything about that. The judge had no comment. The DA's office had no comment. What's different this time is all of your victims were opposed last time. But this time, you have only one victim opposed to your early release. One victim had no comment, and one of your victims is unopposed. And he stated that you've been incarcerated for a very long time, and you deserve a second chance. So you, so you had a victim who says that you need a second chance, and he's unopposed. Martin Ambo, is anything negative since the last hearing? No, nothing is negative. Everything is saying since the last hearing. But I must say that uh, for 18 of his 19 years, years here at LSP, he has been trying to pass the GED high set test. Uh, he only, be, only came two points shy this time on the reading uh, exam. So he has tried his best to pass uh, the high set test. So he must be committed for even trying because he's been trying for 18 years. He's been in the program for the entire 18 years? Uh, yes, he's been in the GED. Thank you, Ward. That, that, that gives me another idea. Thank you so much, Ward. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, now we'll hear from your supporters, uh, Ms. Burbank. Ms. Stanley, you can stay right there. Oh, 
Good morning, board. My name is Chrisides Burring. I'm Travis Rogers Weeks. I'm 18 years old. I attend West Jefferson High School. I attend school and I have a team support group where we talk about mental health issues such as physical abuse, mental abuse, low self-esteem, anger issues, and more. So when he gets released, I'll be helping him start uh, teaching about second chances. He will also have access to resources that will help him help ex-cons find and keep a job. This letter is in support of my uncle of, of this hearing upon today for parole. My relationship with my uncle is a, a very beautiful thing. Travis enjoys attending church and always eager to share his ideas with, with me after. Even at school, he still gets inspired about passing his classes and teaching his buddy new things. He is the best uncle I could hope for. And as the time goes on, his thoughts and attitude has transformed into something wonderful. He's a wonderful support system for me as well. I never thought I would be so close to him because I'm the only girl in the family. It, he has been in prison my whole life, and I know the incident happened uh, happened before I was born. And my belief system as a Christian is talked about mm -hmm. forgiveness. Now I do know that if you don't forgive people, you won't be forgiven. As you think about it, we all send mind, thought, and deep, but God graces with another thing. So today I ask that you give him a second chance because I know that God forgiven him. And now I'm asking y'all to forgive him too. I am in 11th grade. I have a 4.0 GPA and I'm about to graduate, and it will be a blessing to hear him cheer me on, and he promised to support me through college just like he supported me through high school. He was the first person to teach me how to practice on friends, so this this was my prayer stronger than ever. I asked the parole board for a chance to release him, and God bless you all for taking the time for hearing me today. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Ms. Christy, thank you don't want to speak. And it's Derek. It's Derek Rogers, Mr. Marabella, who's going to speak. Okay, Rogers. Derek Rogers. Yes, my name Derek Rogers. I work for Bluefin. Travis Rogers is my brother, and I'm really impressed on how his attitude changed and his ways changed for the last 20 years. He's really. In impressed me on his improvement on making himself better more and more. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. I also show Mr. Nellen, Matthew Nellen. Is he a speaker? Yes, that's the thing. Oh. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matthew Nellen. I am a brother to uh, Travis Rogers. Oh, Mr. Nellen, oh, that, that's okay. They, we can see you now. Okay, okay, go on. Uh, good afternoon, boys. I am a brother to Travis Rogers. Uh, we grew up since knee high, and uh, I'm in a group that is the port, peer support group. I don't know if you all are familiar with it, and what we do is we help ex cons transition when they're coming home, and uh, you know just allow them a place where they can come and find the resources to help value them. And uh, we meet twice a month on the second and the fourth. Tuesday of the month, and we are more than welcoming him upon his release. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Mr. Lancaster, would uh, you like to uh, introduce Mr. Andrews first? Uh, yes, Mr. Mar Maribel, Robert Lancaster with LSU Parole and Reentry Clinic here today representing Mr. Rogers. Uh, with me is Jackson Andrus. He's a second uh, year law student at the law center enrolled in the clinic. He's helped Mr. Rogers prepare for today's hearing. He's also prepared the packet that was submitted to the committee in advance. Uh, Mr. Andrus is uh, 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 willing to make a statement of support for Mr. Rogers should the committee deem it appropriate. Uh, I know Mr. Myers from the Parole Project is also uh, with us. And I just wanted to note that Mr. Rogers is a Parole Project client and would receive their services should he be granted release. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rogers, is there anything you'd like to say before uh, we turn it over to Mr. Anderson? Yes, sir. Uh, at this time, I would like to read my apology letter and it states, state, first of all, I would like to thank the Honorable Board for allowing me the opportunity once again to let my voice be heard. To the Reeler family, Albert Anderson and Elder Frank, and it states, I know there's not enough words to express the pain and hurt I caused when I victimized innocent people for no reason at all. 
who didn't deserve what happened to them. Even though I am, even though I am unable to undo the tragedy that has been caused by me, due to my selfishness and wanting to fulfill my own desire at the expense of others, if I could, I would without hesitating to do so. When I'm determined to get it right and clean up what I messed up, therefore. I take full responsibility for my action and apologize from the core of my heart. I am very remorseful and forever will be. And it's my honest prayer that y'all extend the forgiveness I'm seeking from y'all. I am not, shall not, and will never be the person I once was when they have taken all I've been through to make me the person I am today, who strive better for perfection and try my best to always make today better than yesterday so I can make a difference where I know where it need to be made because I refuse to let my past control my future. So in order to grow, I must be willing to let my present and future be torn unlike my past. I have matured and my character displayed my, my moral strengths that come from finding my best qualities inside myself by believing in them and showing them every day in my behavior because I now know better. When you know better, you do better. Considering when I committed those horrific crimes, I was miserable, lost, broken, and very selfish that wanted what I wanted at the cost of anybody I could victimize. However, I'm now seeking redemption as I continue to model change and lead by example. When I can't say I have changed as a better person, the record don't reflect that. The change wasn't easy, but it was necessary and worthy. Now that I know, my greatest reward would only come after my harder challenge. And it's been a challenge taken for to be a better person. With everything I have learned, I now apply it to my life. Because if I can't devote myself to change now, how can I carry to affect a positive change? So I ask with a sincere heart that this honorable board allow me to return to my family society. Once again, I am very remorseful and apologetic and extend my prayers and best of wishes to all who I heard and victimized. Thank you. Travis. Ms. Rogers, uh, you read very well. I am very convinced that you'll pass your GED the next time. The next one, he's just two points shy. That, that, that did it right there. Uh, Mr. Andrews, would you like to close for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Bella. Um, I'd just like to remind the board that he has one contraband write up in 1997. So he's in a very advanced stage in his recovery process. And even though he has not obtained his GED, he's a very determined individual who has worked for 20 years in the Louisiana State Penitentiary uh, main kitchen, the past for 15 years as a main grill cook. So that will serve him well um, on the outside. Thank you, Mr. Melville. Thank you. Uh, panel ready to vote? Yes. Mr. Roche. Mr. Roger. Yes, sir. Based on all the positive activity, completion of programs, no disciplinary write-ups since your last hearing, my vote is to grant the release without any conditions prior to release. Conditions after release, <clears throat> excuse me, conditions after release. I want you to follow all the recommendations of the STAR program. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have a, have a list of recommendations they give you for release. I want you to follow all the star recommendations. I want you to attend at least three NAAA meetings a week. Yes, sir. I want you to have random drug screens at the discretion of your parole officer. I want you to complete your high set program within the first 12 months of your release. Yes, sir. Don't wait until month 10. Take that test immediately after release. So you must complete your high set within 12 months of release. Yeah. After you earn that high set, after you earn the high set, and you will, I want you to perform community service with at risk you four hours a month. Yes, sir. But wait, you pass the test and you receive your high set. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Uh, Ms. Jackson? All right, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, it's a pleasure listening to you this morning. 
Uh, I concur with Mr. Roche. You have a good disciplinary record. You've done good programming. You've completed the STAR program since your last hearing. So my vote today would be to grant the same conditions as Mr. Roche. Mr. Roberts, you have two votes to grant your parole. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, my vote would be likewise the same to grant your parole, the same conditions as out. So uh, good luck to you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, uh, the committee on parole is called back to order. The time is 2.32. Our next case is Mr. Ronald Washington. Mr. Washington, please give us your full name and DOC number. Ronald Washington, 106426. Thank you, Mr. Washington. Let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record. And then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we'll allow those people who've indicated they wish to have some input to speak. Uh, you have today uh, 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 speaking on your behalf, Ms. Amy Bosworth, uh, Kemp Washington, Dr. Virginia White, and uh, Caitlin Newswanger. You also have uh, uh, here in, in support, but not speaking, Ms. Mary Ford and Ms. Marvette Washington. Uh, at the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Ronald Washington. DOC number 106426. His date of birth is November the 18th of 1964. He is a 10th uh, class offender. He is uh, has a parole eligibility date of August the 1st of 2021. He is not eligible for good time. He is serving a life sentence on the charge of theft of goods after having been adjudicated a habitual offender. Uh, sentencing date was June the 17th of 2005. Is that information basically correct, Mr. Washington? Yes, sir. Washington, your case has been assigned to Mr. Alvin Roche. He will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions he may have? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Washington, I want to hear from the classification officer uh, before we start our interview. Uh, Mr. Washington has a life sentence. He served in practice for 18 and a half years. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. So tell me Can what I happened. clarify the provision? Um, and I wanted to clarify that I'm in my offender records office. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, the provision that Mr. Washington was provided is Act 122 of the 2021 legislate, legislation, where he is a nonviolent lifer and has to serve 15 years to be parole eligible and there is uh, no criteria required. Therefore, when we calculated the 15 year date, Mr. Uh, Washington fell within the perimeters of that legislation and was submitted to the Board of Parole for consideration. So, so that's the same act with, it, with offenders with a number of years and serve 20 and 45. Yes, sir. It, it's exactly the same. It's the same act, Act 122. Right. But on the other legislation, it only applies to offenders who are serving 30 years or above. And then they have to do what they call the 2045. Right. This 122, Act 122, 2021 legislation the offender has to do 15 years for a nonviolent crime without having to meet criteria. No age, no, no other criteria. Thank you. No so other much. criteria. Thank you so much. You're now, Mr. Washington, what you're currently, what, 58 years old? Yes, sir. <laughs> and we can make it a 10 felony. Tell me how does a person be convicted of 10 felonies? Well, to be honest with you, uh, a person of my character at the time, I was going through a lot of things, uh, especially dealing with uh, my drug addiction. And it caused me to uh, over and over and over and again relapse into 
uh, the situation that I put myself in today uh, for is going out and getting self involved into trouble by stealing. The your, first, your first incarceration was almost 26 years ago. Yes, sir. Actually, I'm sorry, 36 years ago. Yes, sir. At some time in between 1987 and right now, you should have gotten tired. Well, I have gotten tired. And I regret I have. It has taken me so long to get tired. But as I will honestly tell you, when you're trapped in a situation for using drugs and things of that nature, it will cause you to linger long, longer and longer if you have the opportunity to. Uh, but, but see, sometimes, Mr. Washington, you build up so much baggage, you can't carry it. You've been on supervision 12 times, and you've been revoked nine times, and you have absconded twice. I've never seen somebody that's been revoked nine times, and two of those included absconding your supervision. You left that. So why should I put you on supervision again? Well, previously in my past, I had a direct attitude of, uh, I didn't care about nobody in particular, except for one to use drugs and alcohol. And since I have been incarcerated this time, I have enrolled in several different programs here in prison that has enlightened me and given me the tools to uh, function within society as a whole and, and has given me uh, the desire to want to take my life back from the so in, in, in 18 and a half years, you decided that it's time to do what's right. Yes, sir. Okay, tell me the theft of goods. What did you do? With the theft of goods? Yes. Well, mainly I go out and go into different department stores and I would steal different things, uh, shirts, pants, what have you, that I could to support my habit of using drugs. Uh, that was dominantly it. Well, uh, what I did with uh, thefts and uh, that derives me to uh, repeat it, the same cycle that I had been on for years and years. Uh, uh, I've tried successfully uh, in the past on my own to try to overcome the addiction, and I just couldn't do it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just answer the question, and we don't need as much editorial behind the answer. Okay. Now, you say theft. When I see simple burglary of an inhabited dwelling, resisting an officer, simple robbery, and these are Ex exposing drug paraphernalia, possession of cocaine, felony death, simple escape. It goes on and on and on. It's just not shoplifting. It's it's serious thing where you break into a home or business and persons are present and you may end up doing something else. What was the indecent exposure about? Oh, urinating out in public. 
and, and, and what kind of drugs uh, were you uh, consuming? Uh, cocaine, marijuana, and alcoholism. How about the forgery charges? Well, uh, I committed a forgery charge. I, uh, I was paid by somebody, and I thought maybe that upon me going to go cash the check that I had received for the work that I had done, that the check was, was legit, but it wasn't. And I got caught for that there. Okay. Now, let, let's let's turn the page on your your criminal activity. Let's talk about your program. Tell me the programs that you completed in the last three years. Um, I completed victim awareness. I completed uh, AA. And I also completed living in balance, one and two. What did you finish victim awareness? Sir? When did you finish victim awareness? Oh, I completed it here at LSP. Okay. When? Uh, that was in 2010. My question was, give me a list of programs that you completed in the last three years. Uh, thinking for a change, anger management. You, and you, fin you finished anger management in 2013. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Give me the program that you completed in the last three years, 20, 21, 22, 23. No. No. no I, have, I haven't completed the last, nothing in the last three years. But Why? Why? Because you only have so many classes available. Okay. So many okay. Programs available. Okay. Um, Opposition in this case comes from the judge in the first JDC. Opposition from the Cato Parish Sheriff's Office. Opposition from the Cato Parish District Attorney's Office and the Chief of Police of Shreveport, Louisiana. Let's talk about your disciplinary conduct. You have 34 disciplinary write-ups, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you've had you've had five disciplinary write-ups in 2021. Is that correct? Yes, sir. What was the contraband all about? There was contraband write-up in 2021. Oh, uh, I had a. Uh, some uh, some yeast and some uh, raw eggs and and another write up I had got for a country band was that uh, I was intoxicated one time uh, for using uh, synthetic marijuana back in that same year. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that it? Mm -hmm. You said country band. You said country band. Yeah. I know. You only had one, 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 one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's all I had. Uh, what, what was the aggravated disobedience about? Aggravated disobedience was about uh, me being late to the work gate. And at the time, I was on the... Uh, that, that was the aggravated work offense. What was the aggravated disobedience about? Aggravated disobedience. Because he flat out refused to go to the gate. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, what was the uh, death about? 
The uh, we stole butter and something else out the kitchen. Still stealing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, sir. And what was the what was the other aggravated work offense? Same thing. Refused to come to a gate for work call. Okay. So, Mr. Washington. Yes, sir. You still taking other property, and you don't follow rules, and you refuse to do what you're supposed to do. You have a low risk assessment. And I see where you're currently enrolled and thank you for a change. Have you completed it? Not exactly. I have about, about two more weeks, two more, two more sessions that we uh, have currently before uh, this program is over with. But, but you just told me five minutes ago that you completed. Thank you for a change. No, I... I didn't say thank you for a change. I never brought that. I said. Okay, okay, okay. Now, I see you're also enrolled in the GED program. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine right now. We are, we are currently on some tests that we're taking for the high set to determine uh, how much more time and how much more uh, we're going to need before we take the actual test. And we had a test today, but I couldn't go to the test because I had to come here. Are you enrolled in GED full-time? Yes, sir. Good, good. Are you a trustee? No, sir. Uh, let's talk about alcohol and drugs. When did you start using drugs? I started using drugs around about... 1979, somewhere. How, in old, how old were you? I was about 13. And what was your drug of choice? Marijuana. Did you graduate to anything other than marijuana? Not at the age of 13, sir. Did you graduate anything marijuana at the age of 20? It was somewhere around that neighborhood, around 21, 22. And what did you graduate to? I graduated to use of cocaine. Did you ever abuse alcohol? Yes, I used alcohol, but I was just a person that had to have alcohol as much as I had uh, used for uh, cocaine or either or marijuana at that time. Uh, Tell me about the treatment that you've received since you've been incarcerated, your substance abuse issues. Well, I, uh, upon going to uh, victim awareness, it taught me a lot about my drug uses and how I had build up a lot of victims in my case over the years and years and years, how I was unaware of the victims that I had accumulated by some of the things that I was doing in society that were wrong. Mr. Washington, answer my question. What have you done about the substance abuse problem? Oh, I have went to a uh, to AA and NA, and uh, I success successfully completed the program, and I currently attend several different meetings uh, a month where we go out and share hope and strength about the tools that we have obtained and learn about the disease that we have of being addicts and it has allowed me the opportunity to, to pick up some tools that will help me function to be a better person and to not use and to, to obtain my sobriety for the rest of my life, hopefully. So the answer is you've not received any substance abuse 
three. One yes. And, one amble. Would you like remarks, comments, or do you have any concerns about this offense? Uh, I have concerns uh, that he's not being truthful in his statements that he made because I have no way on record that he completed um, victim awareness or AANA. I do have that he completed substance abuse in 2013 and also his GED. Uh, he's been enrolled and dropped several times. His last time he re-enrolled was uh, March 14 of 2023, but he was dropped again mm -hmm. on March 31st, 2023 for excessive absence. So he hadn't been going to class. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Walter. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Let's hear from supporters. Uh, Ms. Amy Bosworth? Yes. Hi, good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, ma'am, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, so we were approached, I'm going to say in January, probably late January, and Caitlin, if I have that date wrong, forgive me, I'm picking up the thread from someone else um, about whether or not Mr. Washington could come into treatment upon his parole, as he has reported, he has a history of substance use. Um, and we think he's a good candidate for treatment. Um, that would be something we would make sure there was a bed available for him. Uh, we have short term 28 day treatment. Um, he has the possibility then to apply for either longer term treatment with us or in the community and or into transitional housing, um, which would obviously be something understandably he might need to access. Um, this is Odyssey House's treatment program in New Orleans. Uh, we do have a 3.5 program in Lake Charles and one in Morgan City, but we had been approached about the one in New Orleans specifically. I'm not sure if that makes any difference for y'all. I just wanted to put that out there on the table. It's the same service delivery model. It's just in two different or three different locations, sorry. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mr. Kemp, Washington. Yes. Roger. It's my brother. Okay. Tell us what you'd like us to know about him. He's on mute. Who you want me to? No, no. He's, he's talking to you're, 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 We can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. I, I, uh, thanks, Audible Parole Committee. Uh, like again, my name is Dr. Kemp Washington, retired from U.S. Army after serving 24 years. I'm Ronald Lee Washington, oldest brother. I would like to speak to you on behalf of my family, including my sister, Mary, and cousin, Marvette, who are in attendance. We are very grateful for this opportunity given to Ronald to have a chance at life. Our family, very, very, very close growing up. I have fond mem memories of Ronald as a child. We know Ronald to be a strong and honest person. However, he chose the wrong path in life, and this had led to his 18 years in prison. Throughout this time, Ronald has faced mistakes that has made his that he made in life head on. He faced them head on. And that's a part of being a human being. We're going to do that. We got to face the demons. He has lost many members of our family while he's been in prison. And I know it's been very, very difficult on him and most of us here in his family. He now understands the impact the drugs have on people and their families, especially after the loss of our sister Yvonne. I've seen how Rama has committed to recovering, even though we're, we're just one state over, our family plan to help Ron however we can when he's released. I pray that the board will see these changes that Ronald had made in his life and what a good person he is at, at his core. Ronald has missed funerals, graduations, but I hope they have a chance to be physically present in our lives again. I pray the Honorable Parade Parole Board will grant Ronald an opportunity to come home and demonstrate 
no changes in his life in order to be a better man and a law-abiding citizen. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Washington. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Dr. White, Dr. Virginia White. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Virginia White, and I'm the Client Service Specialist at the Innocence Project New Orleans. And I'm pleased to be addressing the board today on behalf of Mr. Ronald Washington. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with Mr. Washington to develop a reentry plan if he's granted parole today. He has clear goals and appropriate expectations to reaching those goals. And in addition to our support services, he also has strong family support, which some of them are in attendance today, um, including his brother, sister, cousin, and he also has a daughter. And although they live out of state, um, they remain communication with Mr. Washington throughout the years and will continue this support through telephone calls and visits. Um, Mr. Washington, he, He's recognized the progress he's made in recovery, but he also acknowledges that this is a lifelong process. And from my experience working in substance abuse, awareness is the initial stage in making a positive change. He has the advantage of attending the program at the Odyssey House. And after he finishes that program, he also has the opportunity to move into IBNO's transitional home, where he'll continue to receive direct service support um, from our staff. In addition to the immediate support we provide, we've also discussed Mr. Washington's plan to work as a cook, and he also has long-term goals of opening his own cafe. I truly value Mr. Washington's self-awareness around his addiction, and we've made a plan for him to cope with aspects of life that may trigger familiar behaviors of the past. Um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration identifies health, housing, purpose, and community as the four vital aspects of recovery. Mr. Washington has a strong support system in all of these areas. He's committed to his faith, and this is evident through um, his activities and through his continued faith and hope in his recovery process. And it definitely helps him understand and process certain challenges that come up in recovery. Um, I hope that as the board observes today, that Mr. Washington is a smart, peaceful person, and he has a lot of insight to offer. He's had 18 years to reflect and grow. He's aware of the challenges that he, he may encounter during reentry, and we've helped him prepare on how to face those challenges. We look forward to working with Mr. Washington if he's granted parole today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. White. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Mr. Uh, Washington, is there anything you'd like to say before we turn it over to uh, Ms. Weiner? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to say uh, victim awareness at the time, it was an incorporated uh, program that is being administered through 100 hours. And I did successfully complete that trade, I mean, that program back in 2009. But ultimately, uh, I'd like to thank the board for even just allowing me the chance and opportunity to, to share some of the things that has been transpiring in my mind and my life over the last 18 years. And hopefully that if I am granted the opportunity here today from the board that Y'all would take in consideration that I was once was a person that didn't have any care for anything besides my drug uses. But now things have changed and turned around based upon the enlightenment that I have received from God and the tools and understanding that I have received from several different programs here to uh, help and uh Help me cope with the dependency that I has within this disease of uh, being an addict. And I hope that y'all would take that consideration that I have changed only for the better of my condition. And hopefully someday that I can pass it along to other peoples out there in society that the lifestyle that I once lived was only led 
by destruction and now that God has granted me that, granted me this opportunity to be enlightened by some of the programs and the tools that they have put out there for people to become successful and turn their lives around that y'all will give me a second chance. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now we'll hear from uh, Ms. Newsline. Yes, good Good afternoon. Sorry, I was going to say good morning. Um, nice to see you all. Um, I just want to point out that I do think that Mr. Washington's record, if you look at it, it screams criminal, right? And that's what I've heard a lot today is that he does have a long criminal history and there's nothing that can take away from these crimes. Mr. Washington is extremely remorseful of these crimes. Uh, he, he is very candid and real about when he came to prison. He struggled with following rules and he also struggled with trying to fit in with the wrong group of people, which he has communicated to us that was one of his problems uh, when he was younger, fitting in with the wrong people, getting caught up with addiction. And when he first came to prison, that was very indicative. It's on paper, you can see that he has write-ups. Um, I do wanna clear up and that he has, he is currently in thinking for a change. He, he is currently enrolled in GED classes. Um, the programs that he did complete, he, he did complete living in balance as part of his recovery. And he did have some relapses after completing that. And Mr. Washington has actually not expressed to you, and maybe because I might have told him not to speak too much about it, but his faith, when I first met him, his faith was the first thing that stuck out to me. And I know that we can all, we hear a lot about people's commitment to God and faith. And a lot of people who come to prison and they find God. But that's one of the most remarkable things about Mr. Washington is the sincerity and how he decided, I'm not going to run around with this crowd anymore. I'm going to stick to myself and I'm going to have conversations with God and with the church and I'm going to read my daily bread every day. And, and I said, well, that's great, but we really do need to get you into some kind of programs because you need to, to also show that you, you are trying to get you know, better on paper. But it's truly it truly is an honest response that Mr. Washington has been trying to maintain his recovery through his relationship with God. And it has definitely made him a more reflective person. He's very insightful. Um, you mentioned Mr. Roche about his editorial. Uh, this, is, this is what uh, Mr. Washington and I joke about as failing to get to the point. And, but he has a point, you know, he is there. He, when he gets to it, you're like, Oh my gosh, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And, you know, what he did not have before was structure. And Mr. Washington has been at Camp D and it's very difficult sometimes to get into programs. He has a very clear reentry plan with structure. It's centered around his recovery. Odyssey House is a very structured environment where he won't even be able to leave for 28 days. And immediately following that, if he chooses to, he can go into the long-term program or he can go to our transitional house where he will have direct assistance from Dr. Virginia White. So um, I just wish that you all would see the insightful, smart person that I see today and somebody that is a very different person than they were before. <laughs> and for that reason, I respectfully wish that you would grant Mr. Washington's parole today. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments, Mr. Washington. And we Yes. Okay. Russia. Mr. Chairman. Sir. Mr. Washington. I came into this hearing today undecided. Uh, and as the uh, young lady said, that your criminal, your record screams criminal. And I didn't let that get in my way because the crime that you will ritualize for, uh, well, is suspect, fair for good. So I came in with an open mind and I was undecided. Mr. Washington, you didn't do yourself any favors today. You were not honest with us. You didn't tell me that at the end of March, you will drop the GED program. You told me you took a victim awareness and you took a 100 hours free release in one of the modules, one of the very small modules deals with victim awareness. Victim awareness is a whole good time program 
in itself. So based on your performance today, and you were not truthful with us on many occasions, your extensive criminal history, your terrible supervision history, including nine uh, revocations, two situations where you absconded supervision, express opposition from victims and law enforcement, a general disciplinary conduct that's unacceptable. You had five class B write-ups only in 2021. And they like a rehabilitative program. I like to see you get more substance abuse treatment before you get released and go to the IC house. I don't think you're ready, so I'm going to deny your request. Thank you, Mr. Russia. Mr. Jackson. All right. Mr. Washington, uh, I came into this hearing and wanted to get this case serving a life sentence for theft seems to be really, you know, out of line with the actual charge from that you committed. And I came in wanting to help you. Like Mr. Roche said, you didn't give me anything to work with. You really I hear all this talk about how you're committed to your recovery. I see absolutely nothing that you've done. Uh, you haven't taken programs for a long time. You were untruthful with us about some of the things that you had done. And so I'm not seeing this turnaround. I think other people are looking at you through rose-colored glasses and seeing what they want to see. But I see someone who's not ready, someone who's not changed their mindset, someone who is not equipped to be released because if you were to be let out today and you can walk away from the Odyssey house, it's not a locked facility. And you would be right back in a store committing thefts because you haven't dealt with your addiction. And I just don't think you're ready. I think you need some more work. I encourage you uh, to do some work to help yourself. And perhaps the next time you might get a different outcome, but for me today, my vote is denied. You have two votes to deny. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to work a little harder and uh, look a little more inside. Uh, my vote likewise would be the same as my colleagues. So uh, you have three votes to deny your parole. We're always going to deny. Good luck to you. Thank you. Done. We will be adjourned. Uh, Warden, thank you very much for your help. You're welcome. Have a good day. Y'all too.